Okay, we're going to see if Dawn, how are you doing, Dawn? She's still connecting to audio. Gordon, you may want to start. Um. Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, welcome to the session 11, the interdisciplinary and climate research on resilience. I'm Gordon McCain. The, uh, Anna, and anyone who's not speaking, could they mute themselves? And please remember to unmute yourself when you need to speak. This is Renee. Thank you. Everyone should be muting themselves, uh, and if unless you need to, you don't need to have video on because uh, uh, that takes up time. So we've got uh, people still coming in. We're up to 73 participants, but I'd like to get started. Um, just to say that, first of all, I welcome you all as the chair of this session. Uh, the co-chair of the session, whose voice you've heard, is Professor Rene Cyber of the University of McGill University. We've got Ali uh, doing all the uh, computer work so that the PowerPoints will be presented through his site. So you don't need to share your screens, anyone. When we get to uh, discussions, we'll use the chat box. So if you have a question for the speaker, don't raise your hand because we can't see that. But if you enter a chat message, then I will look at them at the end of each as we get in through each speaker and we can ask the questions as the timing is available. So everyone, please uh, mute your audio unless you need to speak uh, and no videos. So if we could go now to the uh, next slide is just next, please. Oh, sorry. Okay. We're now on the, uh, uh, just to give you a quick bank, bank you know, background of this, we are talking about the, the number of damages and the hazardous events in Canada and they're increasing dramatically. The projections for the future are very dependent on how resilient we make our society. Next. It's interesting to look at the global risk report of the World Economic Forum. This was actually released just before in January 2020, so some months ago, but just before COVID became the big issue. But you notice uh, We'll go to the next one, please. That the ones that are in the upper right corner are the ones that are by their assessment, most likelihood and having biggest impact. They are climate action failure. That's no adaptation, no emission reductions. And the one that is most likely with high impact is extreme weather, but also biodiversity loss and et cetera. Food and water crises as well. Next. These things, according to their analysis, are very linked to issues of governance at all levels. If we next, next, and these things come together. So we need to look at the issue in a very broad sense. The last five years are the five warmest years on record. We are dealing with, as the Secretary General of the United Nations said, climate change as the defining challenge of our times. And he called for a number of actions. I won't go through these, but just to say where one of the things we need to do is bring the science together to address the global agenda 2030, which includes the Paris Agreement, the Sendai Framework for Action on Disaster Risk Reduction, Sustainable Development Goals, and others, and bring together projects globally and in Canada. Next. When we talk about interdisciplinary and climate research on resilience, we really need to look at the issues of resilience and adaptation. And that means we need to look at our changing climate hazards and we'll have here talks on that. We'll talk here ones about exposure and vulnerability and risk. We need to think through how you implement these, monitor the success of them and work together to modify them as appropriate. Next. And just to say as our last slide, we need to go from sessions like we're having here to action. We need to look at the COVID-19 situation to build back better or through these various international agreements. And just to say this morning session, we'll have 
you know, second Francis Weirs, then Don Martin Hill, then Charles Lynn, Dale Begwin, and Natalie Carter talking about those issues in the upper left. And then after lunch, you'll rejoin us after a brief break with Roger Pilvarti, Paul Kovacs, Anna Dytep Staff, Rene Seiber, and Paul Godin talking about those issues. So with that, I would like to invite the first speaker of the sessions. Uh, this is the uh, Dr. Francis Weirs, who is director of the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium, who will talk about extremes in the future climate. So over to you, Francis. Uh, thanks very much, Gordon. Um, I'm going to be telling you uh, about precipitation extremes, have, uh, how they're changing, uh, how they are likely to continue to change. I'm reporting on work that uh, I've undertaken with a couple of really talented postdocs, Chao Hong Sun and uh, Muhammad Ali Ben Aliya. Uh, also with Chao Li at uh, East China Normal University and Jubin Jiang at the uh, Climate Research Division. Um, there's a story about this bridge. Um, Gordon might recognize the bridge or some others in the audience might recognize it. If there's time, I'll come back and, and, uh, and ask uh, if Gordon can recognize where the bridge is and if he if he recalls what the story is about the bridge. Next, please. So uh, I'll tell you what my key messages are uh, right now. Um, the first is that the precipitation extremes are changing, but the chances of detecting change in your in your own backyard are are slim. And so I'll, I'll say what I mean by that in, in a few minutes. And that, but it does pose a, an adaptation challenge in the sense that uh, there's lots of opportunity for people to say that they're not actually seeing the evidence. Um, the future in a changing climate um, models project further changes in precipitation extremes. And what they pr project is consistent with what we call Clausius Clapeyron scaling. Uh, so that's kind of like compound interest on, on GICs, about 7% intensification per degree of warming in most mid-latitude land areas or a bit smaller. Uh, recently, there's been a, a flurry of research on a, on a method that um, purports to demonstrate that uh, precipitation extremes could intensify much more quickly using a so-called bidding scaling technique. Uh, we think the method is flawed. And in fact, we think there's no free lunch so that it's you know, difficult to project the future just on the basis of observations. Um, and then if there's time at the end, I'm gonna talk about the future, but in a, in a different sense, in the sense that engineers often think about this, uh, where uh, they, need information about long period return levels in order to design infrastructure. And so that's, that's a little bit different notion of the future than the kind of future that we're thinking about in a changing climate. Next, please. Okay, so uh, first, so I'll entertain you from time to time uh, just to wake you up by showing you uh, the odd photo. This is a photo taken in China and um, not one that, uh, you know, I would be easily be able to get onto a plane and, and take a picture of today, but it's a very beautiful spot in China. So speaking about the present and past precipitation extremes, next slide, please. So observational studies suggest intensification is occurring. Uh, supported by a growing number of global detect and uh, and continental scale detection and attribution studies of long-term changes in extreme precipitation. Uh, so very, very recently, uh, Megan Kirschmeyer young who's now with Environment and Climate Change Canada, published a paper in uh, PNAS that came out just this week. It was reported on the, on the CBC, and it reports on one of these studies for North America, so something a little bit closer to our backyard. Uh, but it turns out that local detection of change at your favorite rain gauge is still very hard. Um, and I'll be demonstrating some, some evidence of that in a minute. Uh, what we are able to calculate from station data is that the rate of intensification uh, in areas that are observed is roughly consistent with Clausius Clapeyron, of the order of six or 7% of intensification per degree of warming. Next, please. Okay, so here's a, a uh, 
image from Chow Hung's work. And what this shows are estimates of observed trends in the annual maximum one day precipitation amount. So the standard measure of, of extreme precipitation. Um, there are about 8,400 dots on this map, 8,400 stations where we have records that are long enough to do this calculation um, scattered uh, unevenly across the globe. So that immediately shows you some of the challenges that we have. The data are not available everywhere. Blues in, indicate intensification. Dark blues indicate uh, significant intensification. Uh, deep reds indicate significant decreases. So you see many more blues than you do uh, reds and yellows. Next, please. Uh, to interpret that, what one way of doing that is to count up, basically count up the number of locations with significant increases. And you see that on this particular map, about 9% of stations show significant increases. These are tests that are conducted at the 5% significance level. Uh, so you expect 2.5% significant increases just as false positives. Uh, we're seeing 9%. It's actually substantially larger than you would expect by random chance in an unchanging world. Whereas the rate of significant decrease in the lower left panel is entirely consistent with the expected rate of, of false discovery. Uh, so there's something going on in the, in, the, in the data record. That's what this is telling us. Um, if you simply naively calculate the amount of intensification per degree of warming at each station and, uh, and average that up, then the number that falls out of the data is 6.6%. Amazingly, per degree of warming, global mean warming, uh, which is amazingly close uh, to, to Clausius Clapeyron. Next, please. Okay, what about the future in a changing climate? Uh, next, please. So we have here some uh, very preliminary results from, um, from CMIP-6 based on a, on a relatively small uh, collection of models. This is work by uh, Chow Li. Um, Chow's busy at the moment updating this using the larger number of CMIP-6 models that are now available. This is for the uh, so-called SSP 585 scenario, so eight and a half watts per square meter forcing at the end of the 21st century. Uh, what it's doing is comparing the magnitude of a 50 year uh, one day extreme event uh, at the end of the 21st century with, uh, with recent decades in the climate models. And you see that the, the percentage of change um, across mid latitude areas is is relatively uniform at about 20% uh, or so. Now that turns out to be a little bit less than Clausius Clapeyron. You see that there are some places uh, on the equator in the intertropical convergence zone where there is very much larger intensification and that's due to the intense convergence of moisture on the equator in those areas. That induces upward motion, uh, pumps dry air into the stratosphere. That air needs to descend again at some places. And so that strengthened tropical circulation leads to places where uh, precipitation extremes also decline in characteristic areas that you can see as the, as the brown and, and orange colors. Um, this is the same result that we got from CMIP-5 and from CMIP-5. Three, this is a really robust kind of finding from, from climate models with this structure being circulation related. Next, please. Um, uh, there's two other slides here about um, the intensification of one day extreme precipitation in CMIP-6 models. Uh, and what's shown here are estimates of the sensitivity of the so how much intensification per degree of warming? Uh, and you see that uh, over mid-latitude northern hemispheric areas where we, where we live, that intensification is of the order of 6% per degree of warming or so. Uh, for 50-year events, perhaps a little bit less for two-year events. And I'll be talking about that a little bit more. There's, a, there's some understanding of why that's the case. Uh, you see that the places where there is strong super Clausius Clapeyron scaling are really only on the on the equator in in, in these results where 
um, in the intertropical convergence zones where there is heavy convergence of moisture uh, uh, at the uh, into that zone. Next slide, please. Okay, well, as, so this point that I've just made that the future depends on rarity. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, is illustrated here as well. This is the same kind of picture, but now produced uh, using a large ensemble of regional climate simulations uh, produced with the CAN RCM4 model, so the Canadian Regional Climate Model. And you see the again for 50 year events that there's a bit more intensification than for two year events. Uh, next slide, please. And what we show here are statistics calculated across grid points across North America from this climate model. And what we're doing is comparing the uh, rate of intensification for five year events against that for two year events. So that there's a differential of about 1%. Uh, for 10-year events, the differential is a little bit bigger. For 20-year events, it's a little bit bigger again. And for 50-year events, it's around about 1.5% uh, or 2% on average across all locations in North America. So what's going on here? Why is this greater intensification occurring for rarer events? Uh, well, what's actually going on, it turns out, is that the intensification of the really rare events is at about the clausius clapeyron rate. Uh, the intensification for the less rare events, two-year, five-year, ten-year events, is a bit below the clausius clapeyron rate. And it turns out that changes in the vertical circulation in this, in this climate model, and, and we see this in other climate models as well, the changes in the vertical uh, circulation are acting to damp the response to warming as opposed to allowing the response to warming to follow clausius clapeyron okay, So the circulation is counteracting uh, the intensification that might occur just in the purely thermally driven world. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, so there's no free lunch from so-called binning scaling. Next slide, please. Now that picture, by the way, was taken in Boulder, Colorado. Um, uh, during a thunderstorm, I was in a hotel room, lots of hail outside, and I was feeling very fortunate that day not to have been responsible for a rental car, because uh, there were lots of rental cars in the in the in the parking lot with damaged windshields. Um, so what you see here uh, in the in the panel on the right is um, the result of a typical kind of binning scaling calculation, where for a particular time of year. Uh, using observations, uh, we will uh, calculate the high percentiles, in this case of extreme hourly precipitation, as a function of temperature at the time of the event. And so you see uh, these kinds of curves that, uh, this is for five stations at the, in the Netherlands where uh, there's really high quality hourly data that extends back uh, for a very long time. So these are, these are kind of gold standard stations. Uh, there's a lot of data there, and what you see at that particular location is what appears to be uh, super Clausius Clapeyron scaling of intense precipitation with temperature at about 14% per degree of warming rather than 7% per degree of warming. Okay, so the naively, what you would then do is say, well, you know, it's going, if it warms one degree on average in summertime at that location, you might read up that curve one degree, and uh, and predict that intense extreme precipitation in the in these locations in the Netherlands would then intensify by 14% rather than 7%. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work that way. Uh, what we're seeing here, these conditional percentiles are confounded with other things that are going on. So there is variation um, across uh, the part of the annual cycle that this samples, for example, uh, the processes that lead to extreme precipitation at six degrees uh, uh, dew point temperature in the Netherlands are probably not the same as the processes that lead to extreme precipitation at uh, 16 or 18 degrees dew point temperature. And so circulation is playing a big role here in, um, in, in af affecting what this curve looks like. But if we look into the future, um, you know, the physical process that is responsible for the most intense extreme precipitation at the moment is likely the same physical process that will be responsible at, at 
in the future. It's you know, convection in the middle of the summer, for example, under very warm, moist conditions uh, is could could well be the, the the process that's responsible in a particular place. Next slide, please. So we've been studying this within regional climate models. We're using the CAN-RCM4 large ensemble for this. Uh, and so you can do these calculations in um, the climate models. And, and so on the left-hand side, you see estimates of uh, the binning scaling rate for the 99th percentile of three hourly precipitation as simulated by that model. On the right-hand side, you see the so-called trend scaling rate. So that, that is an estimate of the change in the annual, basically the annual maximum or summer maximum three hourly precipitation in that model. And you see that the two patterns don't coincide at all. And it's a pattern on the, le on the right that is the, is the pattern that is telling us about uh, how the most damaging extreme precipitation event in the model is changing over time, not the panel on the, on the left. And so uh, we would argue that the panel on the left is really not very useful for informing what it is that we need to know about uh, the stuff that really might be damaging, which is in the panel on the right. Next, please. Okay, uh, I think I'll go on uh, now to the next slide. I've, I've made my point about the binning scaling. Okay, so the future in a static climate, and so this is a very static, uh, tranquil scene in, in China, a very old piece of infrastructure in China, uh, reputedly about 700 years old or so, uh, not very stressed by the environment, obviously. Next slide, please. Um, what engineers are talking themselves into as they're revising the Canadian building code and, and thinking about design practices is, uh, the implementation of design practices that they call uniform risk as opposed to uniform hazard. In Canada at present, we're using uniform hazard design practices, which means that the reliability of a particular building um, can vary from one place to another, depending on uh, the environmental conditions that it's exposed to. And so we're, the engineers are trying to find a way of, of um, evening out that, that level of risk. Uh, in thinking about this, one of the things that, that they get driven towards is the use of very long return level, uh, return period return level estimates, much longer than they typically use in, in engineering design practices at the moment. And so that prompted us to ask about uh, how reliably using standard um, methods can we um, estimate very long return level estimates. Uh, and so we, uh, again, this is a question that you can ask in the context of a regional climate model where uh, you have a large ensemble of simulations. So we have available an ensemble of 35 simulations with hourly precipitation available from each one of them. You can calculate annual maxima over the historical period that, that we're studying here, uh, 1951 to, to 2000. Uh, that allows you to study a sample of at each location of 1,750 annual maxima that are representative of that period. And so you can test the standard extreme value analysis techniques and, and learn exactly how well they're performing. And so um, what you see here uh, in these two panels are estimated biases for extreme precipitation in this model. Estimated biases in the estimate of the 100 year return level using a standard technique and the 1000 year return level using a standard technique. And you see that for the 1000 year return level, those biases are large and, and, and substantial with, with quite a bit of uh, geographic organization. So underestimation all up and down the west coast of North America, overestimation most places in the interior of North America. Next slide, please. These, these biases are large enough to, to be of engineering significance, I would argue. Uh, so to see what's going on, we, we um, looked at some individual locations. And, and so if you focus on the center two panels, um, 
the blue curve and the uncertainty that is associated with that blue curve is the standard fit of an extreme value distribution that that uh, you would that you would obtain if you were um, using a so-called generalized extreme value distribution to, to analyze uh, the data. The data are the, the black dots, so that the black dots correspond to the 1,750 annual maxima that are available. If you use just 50 of them and fit the GEV distribution, you get the blue curve, which doesn't fit uh, at the Vancouver location or at the Denver location. The observation is pretty well, but in an opposite sense. Um, if you use all, so I use 50 because 50 is roughly the number that are available in standard uh, analysis from observations. If you imagine that you might be able to have 1,750 observations at a particular location, then you get the red curve. So now all of the, the, the parameter estimation stuff goes away. Um, I'll be finished in about two minutes. Um, uh, but still, it doesn't fit very well. In fact, uh, it becomes evident that the, the fit is uh, in the deep tail is, is relatively poor. Uh, and so if you actually see what's going on there in Vancouver, the Vancouver grid box, for example, it appears that there are two processes that are governing uh, extreme precipitation, one that operates most of the time, another that operates less frequently. So you can see that in the, in the, in the kink in the, in the sequence of dots. Uh, and that's what, what we trace that back to is the occurrence of intense atmospheric rivers that affect that particular location that are, are actually pretty well simulated by that model. Okay, so there's, there's complexity in the tail of the distribution that, um, that uh, practitioners are aware of. They have um, uh, numerous ad hoc techniques for, for trying to deal with that. Um, not the reliability of those techniques is not necessarily particularly well known. And so what would be desirable is some other statistical technique that, that extracts additional information from the available data to determine what the shape of the tail is more, more reliably. That's a little bit closer to the physics. And so I don't have time to report on that, but we do have a solution that, uh, that, that, helps to control this bias in a, in a much better way, uh, at least in these, in these climate models. And, uh, but it's, it's more complex for, uh, for practitioners to apply. It's some, this is a problem that's, that's, that's of course well known in some senses, but it's also one that's routinely ignored in the, in the process of working through a, a design process. Okay, next slide, please. And so this this is actually um, the result that's obtained uh, when when we apply this solution that statistical solution that I that I referred to. Uh, so the biases in the hundred year return level more or less disappear. The biases in the thousand year return level become small and, and manageable and and scattered across the the continent. And um, so this is a situation where with hard work, you might actually get something close to a free lunch because this is based on, um, based on, uh, I, I'm misspeaking actually, uh, the result that you get from the, the method that we're using looks like this, but these, these charts come from a, from a different aspect of the analysis. Um, but in any case, the, 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 the method that we have proposed uh, can perform somewhat like this, uh, producing small biases based on only 50 years of data, if you have the right data. Next slide, please. Okay, and next slide, please. It's probably uh, pretty much a good place for me to stop. Uh, so again, um, something, uh, another piece of infrastructure is very heavily used bridge in, in Nanjing with an enormous amount of traffic passing underneath it. So uh, one of the things that I've tried to feature in this talk of few pictures of infrastructure. Next, please. Okay, so just to remind you what the messages are, uh, precipitation extremes are changing, but if you look at an individual rain gauge, there's less than a one in 10 chance of seeing a significant trend in intense precipitation at that, at that rain gauge. Uh, that's still much larger than we expect by, by random chance. 
Um, models project further changes in extreme precipitation as the, as the climate continues to warm in a way that's consistent with Clausius Clapeyron scaling in most mid latitude land areas. Uh, the excitement about the binning scaling uh, calculation and the possibility that maybe you can extract this information simply from about the future, simply from historical observations um, is uh, just a bit too good to be true. Uh, so there really isn't a free lunch in that sense. And when we're thinking about uh, the future in a static sense, estimating long period return levels, what we're really doing is estimating uh, the uh, a threshold that would be exceeded once every so many years where we specify what so many years are in a climate that represents uh, the climate that we're currently in. Uh, and we can define currently in different ways, so that can be moving with time. Uh, but uh, we need to do a careful job of estimating what these long period return levels are because uh, they're uh, very heavily used in, in engineering design. And the standard tools that we use might not be up to the task. And that's, that's it. Next slide, please. Okay, and just to acknowledge uh, some of the sources of support for this work and the, and the people that I'm collaborating with. Uh, so, uh, Gordon, I had a question for you about the bridge at the beginning. Yes, well, I'll answer you. There aren't any other questions, but just let me say that I think that's in North Vancouver and there was some tragedy to do with it or something, but I don't remember now. Uh, so that's, you're, you're, you're very close. It's the Alexandra Bridge on, uh, on the Fraser. It's an ex impressive place to be in June at the peak of the, of the spring freshet with uh, you know, 15,000 cubic meters per second flowing underneath your feet. Mm -hmm. uh, that particular version of the bridge is not used anymore. It was, it was built in, in 1926. Uh, there was a bridge built on that site in 1867 and there's a very famous photograph of that bridge taken in 1894, which is the flood of record on the, on the Fraser, about 17,000 cubic feet cubic meters per second with the water at the bridge deck and so the uh, you know the engineers that designed that particular bridge um, which isn't the one that I took the photo of uh, obviously didn't have sufficient information about long period return levels uh, for uh, water heights in the in the Fraser at the Alexandra bridge site. Yeah Okay, well, thank you very much, Francis. I think we're, we've run out of time in this session. We need to move on. Just let me tell you all that, that you are now one of 107 people in the room. Um, I think, in, although we've just got a question, I think in view of the time, we'll pass that on separately and we'll need to move on. Thank you very much, Francis, to Anna. Sorry, did, oh, sorry. <laughs> the next speaker is uh, Professor uh, Don Martin Hill of the Department of Anthropology, McMaster University Indigenous Program, who will talk about well, the slides up, co-creation of indigenous water quality, and dealing with water as the first environment. So over to you, Don. Sorry for the slight delay. <laughs> you have to unmute your mic there, Don. <laughs> um, um, hi, I'm uh, coming to you from Six Nations, uh, Grand River Territory, um, and I've been the PI of several projects, um, some of which I'm going to show you the tools we're creating, which is the focus of this presentation. The two communities are Lubicon Cree and Six Nations, but the work we're doing, we're hoping to create tools for Indigenous people wherever they may live to give them an idea of ways to mitigate um, climate change impacts uh, on vulnerable communities. Next. Next slide. So some of the colleagues, and this is by no means all of them, um, are listed here um, just to uh, acknowledge we have uh, engineering teams, we have a biology team, earth sciences, um, as well as social sciences and uh, many more. Um, the research we're doing is new and different because Indigenous knowledge is actually leading uh, the way in, in shaping the, the science uh, that we are doing in the community together. So rather than bringing Indigenous people in um, after the foundation is kind of built and, 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 and having them adapt, 
this is creating from the ground up uh, to mitigate um, uh, climate change impacts regarding water, water security, water quality, water source. We're following the two row wampum, which is um, the Gaswenta was made first with the Dutch, later with the English and all uh, British, um, and, and is still acknowledged today by government. But essentially it's a self-determination uh, document um, to us, it's coded. So if you look at wampum, the way we look at it is the way a coder might look at his computer programming. So we can read these things while they may look simplistic to others, there's a lot of information in there, but it is about, we'll stay in our canoe, you stay in your ship and let's coexist peacefully, but not try to steer each other. And I think that's a good uh, paradigm to work within. And we acknowledge that indigenous people for the longest time um, have uh, been stewards of the land and the water and continue today to protect that water. And I think the United Nations recent report by 145 scientists concluded that in fact, as they uh, assessed what was happening around the world, it was very clear any lands and waters managed by indigenous people essentially were doing well. Um, so maybe there's something to learn there. Um, and to work together. Next slide. Next. Is it working? There we go. So the question is, I think for this audience in particular is, oops, um, might want to go back one, is um, indigenous, uh, what is indigenous knowledge? What is traditional ecological knowledge? Um, and that slide is missing, but essentially, um, we, we have uh, attentions, I think, in trying to communicate and work together um, based on the way in which we think about the world and, and, and the way we conceptualize it. And a lot of it is because our languages, which is where the knowledge exists of the land, uh, understanding the connections, not just between all things are related, but understanding that uh, the earth is related to the to the stars and there's things that will happen and they would take uh, steps to mitigate any kind of impact. So it was holistic in a really in a, in a universal sense. It's also action noun based. So looking at science, often indigenous people feel it's very um, abstract and, and, and not action oriented. In other words, they don't wanna, they don't have a lot of descriptor. If you talk about water, it's about our relationship with water more than it is about uh, water as an abstract, uh, decontextualized uh, entity that we need to study. So even just doing a water project, um, elders and community have a bit of problem disconnecting water uh, from all other con context of the environment and ecosystem. So the idea is to, to try to bring these two systems together. And I will say it is challenging for everybody involved, but because of the current state of our environment and ecosystem and water security, I think we're working through some of the most important aspects of indigenous knowledge uh, and, and Western uh, science. And just respecting each other's ways, I think is, is where we stand right now. Next. Okay, so one of the um, important aspects that we try to communicate is that, again, our identity and our knowledge comes from geography. So if you're Hopi, um, a lot of the uh, identities and, and the knowledge you have is about the landscapes and geography and the history of that geography and the words and the, the knowledge is gonna be tied to that certain space over time. Uh, again, if you're Lillawat from the mountains, um, you're going to have a lot of information, particularly about that environment. And if you're Haudenosaunee or Mohawk, as I am, then you have information about the Great Lakes, um, New York, and, and Pennsylvania, which are traditional territories. So even your songs, your dances, this is how knowledge is transmitted. So it's very hard to translate that to Western scientists, but you can't really have information about water or what the knowledge is unless you have an understanding of the culture and the language. So we work closely with elders, linguists, um, to help us understand and articulate what we need to be doing to mitigate 
uh, water, uh, climate change and water security. And often they talk about the, uh, the Thanksgiving address as the primary tool in which to understand the world. It's something that's done often in our communities, in meetings. Um, we recite it at every ceremony in Longhouse. Um, but it, it goes back to the time of dinosaur. It actually goes back to creation. And it talks about the different roles and, and, and ways in which indigenous uh, um, people came to the earth and then how to interact with their environment. So mobility was very important. The fact that we could move seasonally um, or we would not live near water per se um, was important. Uh, they were our highways, but we also knew about flooding and, and, and seasonal activities. So we adjusted our way of life to that. Obviously, uh, through colonialism and 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 uh, where we are today, um, it's it's generally a reserve. It's a boundary that doesn't always um, support a way of life. So those are the struggles Indigenous people are trying to adjust to, and and the vulnerability that's there. So giving an idea of water and how they look at water, I uh, had a student, Denise McQueen, who put together a, a little uh, digital story, which is one of the tools that we create to uh, transmit our information to the public. Next. We'll be showing that, I think, if everything works. So when Sky Woman so here it um, uh, comes from the sky world, she goes through this dark tunnel first, and when she emerges from the dark tunnel that was her first words and that she said nekne ohnega iga so when she lands here on the back of the turtle that represents that the land came up it needed the earth to uh, propagate life so again into the waters where she sent the animals to bring life up in the form of earth to put on the turtle's back. So when they say Gahni <clears throat> Gardunyu, um, and others will say Ganyadaraharahede, which means that these waters are up, they're elevated. And what that means is they're connected with the rain. So then they say Gahni Ganor, so why is the water precious? Well, we also say when it's raining, yoga noro. Yoga zi ganoro. It's visibly precious. So thank you. Um, next slide. So I think that our, our way of our worldview and the lens in which we approach the world, it's still going on today. Um, this is Alina Sky. She's 12 years old. It was a public speaking. Um, event in the community and also a protest um, uh, against Nestle. And she uh, did a, a speech in which she won many awards for, and I just pulled a little bit from that. But culturally and spiritually, every morning in our schools at Six Nations, we say the Thanksgiving address. It's, it's a way of life here. We give thanks to water, all bodies of water. We give thanks to the lakes, rivers, streams, the large bodies, small bodies of water, even down to our groundwaters the waters that flows under our feet to bring life and help sustain our people, this is very important. And we have recognized this since the beginning of time. We need to keep recognizing that, protecting our groundwater. So I think it's, it's important to acknowledge, even though our way of life is different, the knowledge from ancient, ancient information is passed on today to, to the next generation. And our project hopes to merge science into some of the traditional ecological knowledge that our people hold as a as a way of life rather than as a science. Next slide. So our team reflects the way in which it evolved and we have actually three uh, uh, projects with Global Water Futures, a CHR, we've had an NSHRC and now we have a SHRC um, because a community has different stakeholders who have different um, approaches to addressing uh, water quality, sourcing, and preparedness for the future. Part of that is traditional ecological knowledge, but uh, I hope you understand why language is critical to understanding mapping. So we want to have uh, uh, maps that outline both the history of our landscapes and our waterscapes, 
the present and importantly for the hydrology and hydrogeologists, the future so that the community can mitigate. Um, we also have a, a living archive so that elders can upload or students will actually work with elders and traditional knowledge to upload our knowledge as well as scientific. Uh, I have a little bit of a, a snapshot of the virtual reality that will disseminate uh, all the results from all the teams, the, including modeling, which is very uh, a great interest to, to Six Nations, but also the development of the sensors that will then be deployed. Um, they will be affordable and monitored through uh, personal apps that they can upload. So they wanted tools, um, which is kind of relating to the action. They also want to move in the next phase of our, our, our project into biological sampling. Um, they want to look at hair um, because we did find mercury. We'll talk a little bit about that if I have time. Um, but also looking at how they can bring back the health of both streams uh, at, at groundwater protected as well as the Grand River. So there's a lot of different teams, a lot of different stakeholders. As you can see, it, it gets quite complex. Um, but I think it's really um, important work because we're trying to uh, reduce the risk to vulnerable communities. Um, next slide. So the way that we interact with each other is we waited for the first phase, which was the biological assessment that uh, Dr. Chow did, and then we respond accordingly with the other team. So each team feeds the work and the way in which um, we gathered this information. Next slide, please. So uh, this is Charles and the elders um, that were are advising, we now have the Haudenosaunee Confederacy who created a water committee. Um, we have a grandmother's council and many other um, groups that are informing different aspects and, and they actually uh, advised, and we didn't have it in the first grant, um, to look at heavy metals, which is not normal for this area. I guess they thought more around E. coli and, and, and farming uh, runoff and contamination. But actually um, when he did, and, and, we, and we did support that, um, we found that there was in fact five different heavy metals, mercury being the most concerning. Of course, we found other things, uh, uh, chromium, aluminum, and so on. So these are the information we feed back to the community and then they, they help the uh, science team Put together the next phase of what we're going to do about that so they're going to broaden the water testing because there's no real rhyme or reason to where we're finding tap water uh, mercury contamination as well as well as well as our streams next slide please. Your timekeeper you have one minute okay so i'm gonna skip over the health data but you know we you can look at that i'd rather end it with one of the tools that will house all of this information um, next slide. And, and that's creating a living digital archive. So all of this information will be available, but more importantly, that we're going to have it in different mediums. So not just public published academic articles. Next slide. But they're actually going to have um, uh, tools. Next slide. Uh, for the uh, First Nations communities beyond us. So this is the last team, which is including mental health. If you could just end it um, with the um, the virtual reality that Mohawk College is co-creating with elders in the community and where we're going to house all the science so that the public can engage. And we are meeting um, with this. So this it's not working so what we have is past present future and as they travel they're they're going to learn um you're, you would have seen a canoe uh with the sensors the monitors that we're building and the way to reach out to the public so that they continuously monitor so maybe they'll take more responsibility for the the water and learn about uh, mitigating factors. Well, what are we going to do if, if, if we are flooding and this whole area is flooded and then 50 years we have drought. So it gets people thinking about how to uh, mitigate these factors. Um, one of the things we did find out was that a lot of our young people are um, experiencing a lot of anxiety and stress. 
because they don't have running water at Six Nations. I didn't acknowledge that 90% of our community, even though we have a high uh, a socioeconomic status um, here at Six Nations, does not have uh, access to clean running water to the treatment plant that's uh, just down the road because there's no funds for infrastructure. Um, so what you have is people uh, buying water through the truckloads, putting it in cisterns or old wells, um, wells are contaminated by and large. Um, they're not drinking that water. So they have to truck it in for the most part and buy it. And then they also buy drinking water, which is different. So what we found is when they run out of water, they're concerned about the future, that they're not going to have access to water or ever get running water. And what that does is it, 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 it the stressor, um, if you can imagine uh, uh, half of the home births through the birthing center don't have uh, running water in their homes. Uh, and, and I've been in that situation and you run out of water, you can't go to work, you can't do things. And they also know that there's a racialized approach to who has access to water, who has a, a cleaner environment because we tend to be in the, in the toxic, um, contaminated areas of Canada today. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, we, we need a lot of information and we're not just gonna house our information, but a lot of the information that is being put out by uh, the scientific community, we're gonna do our best to translate that and house it in this living archive, as well as the virtual reality, which has three phases to it, including the future so that all First Nations uh, or vulnerable communities can have access to these ideas, these concepts, uh, learn how to work with uh, Western science and, and co-create information that is both you know, good for science um, as well as maybe enhancing what Western science is doing by attaching it to wisdoms that can only be found by the, the First Nations of this community because they've been observing uh, the environment, acknowledging uh, changes, and also they have ideas about what's coming. We've been brought up to understand that the, the earth is going to change and things are going to happen um, because of human activity. And these are the things that we need to do to mitigate that. So we're also working with traditional people. We're also developing science uh, textbooks because uh, I didn't realize the school here at Six Nations, uh, they have to create their own curriculum and they didn't have access to, let's say the graphs and charts that you're showing that they would be really interested in. So we're also doing what we call service or knowledge mobilization as a, as a big component, capacity building, focus on uh, young women, sending them to the UN, and so on. So it's, it's a very uh, holistic approach to science. Thank you. Well, Don, thank you very much for your presentation. In view of the time, we'll skip over the question or two, but thank you very much. Uh, um, and uh, to say we'll go right on to the next presentation, which is uh, Dr. Charles Lynn, who is uh, retired, but he's really was previously the Director General of Atmospheric and Climate Science and Environment Canada, Director General, I guess, and uh, a whole variety of things. So over to you, Charles. Thank you, Gordon. So uh, as Gordon indicated, I, I retired three years ago, and, uh, and uh, this is, if you want, uh, one of my retirement projects. Next slide, please. I will go over the project uh, team members and make a few remarks to set the context. That's the introduction. And then one of the key messages is individual versus collective actions that are needed for Canada to reach net zero. We will then focus on two sectors, two key sectors. First is the energy sector and then the financial sector. And then the last two points will be on how Canada would reach net zero by 2050 and the mission of uh, my project. Next slide, please. So to introduce the team members, uh, I have, um, I retired three years ago after a 38 year career in academia and government, 27 years at U of T and McGill and 11 years at uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada. And the last 10 years of my career were spent in ECCC and I was responsible for the management of the weather science, climate science and air quality science for the department. James Lynn has a PhD in energy economics from the University of Alberta, and he is also uh, a team member. 
Stephen Foon has uh, sustainability expertise and, and uh, he has worked in this capacity with uh, Mitsubishi Electric. So I spent last year, 2019 at Harvard, and I was a fellow of the Advanced Research Initiative, which is a program that Harvard uh, designed for people who, who have had some leadership experience and who want to contribute back to society. And, uh, uh, and for me, the contribution is in the form of this project. So this project was refined when I was uh, a fellow there. Next slide, please. Now, net zero is a scientific concept. I think you're all familiar with it. This is the idea where, where uh, emissions of CO2 have to be balanced by removal. And this is at, really at the heart of how we might reach uh, 2 degrees C, 1.5 degrees C, all these, uh, all these um, goals that uh, IPCC have, uh, have advanced. 83%, a vast majority of Canadians are extremely concerned, very concerned or quite concerned about climate change from a recent uh, abacus survey. So there's a lot of concern out there. Uh, the, one of the challenges is what can I do? And I'm frequently faced with that question. And when Trudeau was reelected, he had committed one of his election uh, promises on his platform was to have the country reach net zero by 2050. So these are, uh, I'm going to approach this talk with just showing several key numbers. So 83% is the first one, 2050 is the second one. And, and there have been several federal initiatives uh, in the last few years which uh, positioned the country which try to position the country to move towards this goal. The Canadian Institute for Climate Choices is, uh, is an organization that is a direct result of this uh, promise. And I believe the next speaker is uh, from this uh, institute, so I won't say much more about it. Generation Energy is uh, sponsored by uh, Natural Resources Canada, and it's a forum for Canadians to, to uh, discuss input how Canada would reach a low carbon uh, state. Low Carbon Cities Canada is, um, is uh, seed funding from the federal government, 43 million, I believe, to seven cities across Canada to accelerate uh, urban climate uh, solutions. So there have been federal initiatives that, uh, help, that uh, aim to help the country to reach this goal. Next slide. Individual actions. And I'll start with a personal uh, situation. We, uh, my wife and I, and uh, before our children left, uh, the three kids, five of us, we were carless, we were without a car since 1991. And since then, we have lived in Paris, France, a year when I was on sabbatical leave, and then the, the, the rest of the time in Montreal and Toronto. I still live in Toronto, so it's been 29 years without a car and still counting. We raised three children. In today's language, I would have made a lifestyle choice to reduce individual carbon footprint. 29 years ago in 1991, this, people didn't talk this way, and we, the, the goal was really to save some money to pay down our mortgage, and, uh, and to be environmental at the same time. Okay. And, uh, and this has worked. So the next bullet shows how difficult it is to scale up individual actions like this. According to uh, scientific research, you save by going without a car, you save two tons of CO2 emissions per year. And then to, to juxtapose that, GHG emissions from personal vehicles in the city of Toronto in 2016 is 5 million. 32 million tons from cars, light trucks, and motorcycles in Ontario in 2016. 143 million from road transportation in Canada in 2016. So you can get an idea of the magnitude of the task at hand to scale up individual actions. You have, to, you have to scale up by seven orders of magnitude, from two 
to 10 million plus. Right. So, and this is not going to happen on its own. Right? That's uh, pretty clear because uh, people make choices based on uh, individual preference and also incentives. And incentives come in the form of carrots and sticks. An example of a carrot is a carbon tax. An example of a stick is, uh, is um, uh, cash uh, contributions to help, uh, to help buy uh, electric vehicles, for, for example. And uh, when Doug Ford came into government in Ontario and removed the incentives for purchase of EVs, EV sales immediately declined. So the main message here is that it is very, very difficult to scale up individual uh, actions based on lifestyle, lifestyle choices. You need to, to transform individual actions to collective actions. Next slide. So let's turn to the energy sector, fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas. Two numbers. The first one is 85%. 85% of the world primary energy consumed in 2018 come from coal, oil, and gas. And second number coincidentally is also 85%. Canada's primary energy produced in 2016 is in coal, oil, and gas. The Canada also ranks sixth in uh, primary energy productions in 2015 worldwide. 22% of, uh, of uh, Canada's total goods exports is related to energy. And so that's, so in other words, Canada is an energy producing country. So that's a conundrum. The world is using a lot of energy in the form of coal, oil, and gas, and Canada is good at producing coal, oil, and gas. So the second bullet or the third bullet focuses on the international and Canadian scenes. In the last six months or so, Big internationals have announced ambitions to reach net zero by 2050. BP, Shell, and Total have all announced within the last six months. And, uh, and a major player that, uh, that has stayed on the sidelines is ExxonMobil, where they have decided uh, to not do so. Now, it's also interesting to note in view of the COVID developments that uh, none of these three have, uh, have uh, retrenched this ambition. And Shell, in fact, announced the ambition after COVID. On the domestic scene, Senevis has targeted uh, net zero by 2050. Suncor has no formal net zero targets. Instead, they aim to reduce em emission intensity. This is the amount of the GHG emitted per barrel of oil. Right. And CNRL, C Canadian Natural, has long-term aspirational goal to reach net zero. So all this to say is that, all this to say that, uh, that uh, the, the fossil fuel industry is making some pretty strong statements right, about net zero. Now, the precise pathways to reach that is not well defined, other than a reliance on technologies which are not fully developed, or at least not developed to the, to the scale where it can be scaled up to, to, to the magnitude required. For example, carbon capture and storage. And there are also, there's also reliance on policy instruments such as carbon pricing, trading, and offsetting schemes. Next slide. In the financial sector, there is a, there's an emerging driver known as ESG, environmental social governance. So this is a corporate social responsibility, CSR, impact investing, green investing, it's known in various names. But loosely, uh, it is really the consideration of, of environmental factors in, uh, in investing. 
BlackRock, the largest asset management company in the world with assets of $7 trillion. Their CEO, Larry Fink, announced in a letter to, uh, to fellow CEOs, climate risk is an investment risk. Every government company and shareholder must confront climate change. Mark Carney, former governor of the Bank of England, led an open letter on climate-related financial risks. And he, he says on the transition to net zero by 2050, this transition requires a massive reallocation of capital. If some companies and industries fail to adjust to this new world, they will fail to exist. Strong words. So if you follow the money, right, there is a, uh, there's a fair bit of uh, emerging considerations on, uh, on, uh, on uh, ESG. And of course, the fossil fuel industry is funded uh, to a large extent by the banks. Next slide. So for Canada to reach net zero by 2050, we, are, we are for sure need government leadership. Transitions away from the current regime of heavy fossil fuel use, recall 85% of the world's use of energy comes from fossil fuel in industrial tra transportation agricultural sectors. So we need to transition away from this current regime. The magnitude of the transition and their impact on society are unprecedented. And the public is not aware of this, right? Or, or much of the public is not aware of the, of, of this, uh, of, of the scale of the task at hand. And the transitions would only happen with government inter intervention. 10 million Canadians are not going to decide to go without a car, just like that, right? Uh, one or two might, maybe 10 or 12 might, but 10 million, no, that's not going to happen, right? The second important uh, component is a, is a constructive engagement of the fossil fuel industry. And I think they, they are essential actors to uh, determine pathways to reach net zero. Uh, they are, there are pathways, their ambitions announced, but as I indicated earlier, the precise pathways are not uh, well defined. This is your timekeeper, one minute. Thank you. And we need to scale up individual actions. And I put to city levels here because the cities are very active in uh, developing urban climate solutions. And people live in cities, people identify with cities, and people identify also with their carbon footprint, which is intimately tied to city initiatives, such as uh, more effective uh, mass transportation, more efficient buildings and homes, and so on. Final slide, the project mission. I already mentioned the gaps. The public is not aware of the magnitude of the task to reach net zero. Going without a car, eating less red meat, using your less dryer, using your dryer less often. Uh, these are all worthwhile initiatives, but on their own, they will not help us reach net zero by 2050. Constructive engagement of the fossil fuel industry is essential. I don't believe that comments like uh, all is dead uh, would be helpful uh, uh, in uh, engaging the fossil fuel industry. <coughs> I have assembled a team, James and Stephen, working part-time on this. Our project mission is to widen and advance pathways for Canada to reach net zero. And we do this by harvesting the power of collective actions of informed citizens through cities. So there's a role here in, in informing the citizens. And since we all live in cities, or many of us live in cities, uh, there and cities are doing good work in, uh, in uh, formulating urban climate solutions. So uh, we've decided to, to go through cities on this. And we want to create opportunities to synergize corporate ambition and public actions. By corporate, we mean the fossil fuel industry and, uh, and the banking industry. Right? 
So these are ambitious uh, goals, uh, but I think the need is there, and uh, I uh, and the team will uh, will uh, will work on this. So I'll stop there. Thank, Thank you, Charles. Um, we are running behind schedule a bit, but let me say to the others that the um, uh, there is we we can run beyond the twelve thirty limit and uh, continue. Uh, we, we will restart session, we'll start session two, but it, by plan, assuming it will work, is that we would run the Zoom session just continually right through, and you can come and go as you choose. Um, and we're going to see if we could show uh, Don Martin Hill's uh, video during the break period when we're back online again to see if uh, we can make it work better because it was an interesting one. So, what, but to this point, there. Uh, I see only a, there's a question oh, about individual things. I think in view of the timing, we better ask uh, Trevor Smith to uh, send his comment on and try and get, I mean, the whole question of transportation and action does need activity. And well, anyway, Charles is working on it. I think at this point, we have to move on to the next presentation, which will deal a little bit with the same thing. No, not not the... We're not going to show Don's presentation right now. We'll show Dale Begwin. There it is, the Canadian Institute of Climate Choices. Dale is the Vice President of Research and Analysis for the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices, formerly with the Ecofiscal Commission, National Roundtable, and other things. Over to you, Dale. Great. Thanks, Gordon. Okay, so I, I'm going to give you a little sneak peek at one of the projects that the Institute has underway. So this isn't a final product. It's more of something that's kind of in the middle of things. Uh, but still, I think quite interesting and builds on some of the other things we've heard this morning. Uh, so we're going to talk about the cost of climate change for Canada and bring kind of an economic frame to some of the things we've heard earlier. Uh, next slide, please. So we are a brand new organization just launched earlier this year. So a quick comment about what the Institute is and where we come from. Uh, this is a fully, uh, sorry, back, back slide, there we go. We're a fully independent organization, uh, arm's length, but funded through the federal government, uh, but entirely nonpartisan, entirely evidence-driven, bringing together experts from a range of disciplines from across the country. Uh, and I think that we have a couple things I wanna highlight there that, that kind of drive our mandate. One is this idea of integration that we are trying to look at issues of mitigation and adaptation and clean growth together rather than separate and trying to look for those linkages and to bring them all through in different parts of our research. And the second is this idea of clarity of trying to provide better information to help make governments, help governments make clear eyed decisions based on evidence, especially when those choices have big implications for the country and for the prosperity of Canada, uh, Canadians. Next slide, please. So I'll take full advantage of Charles' previous uh, presentation to pitch for some of the other things that we have in the works. So th this is a quick look at some of the projects we have underway right now, uh, including some work at carbon budgets and how we can establish governance frameworks to help create the conditions for Canada to get to that net zero destination that Charles talked about. We're doing some work looking at what those pathways to net zero might look like, uh, both for the country as a whole, as well for regions. We're doing some work in terms of how to frame those pathways and those outcomes in success measures that are broader than just emissions and how to explore how the successful pathways to net zero bring in social and economic dimensions as well as those emissions and climate dimensions. And the one I want to talk about today is this last one, this, this cost of climate change. And this, this is a big project with a few different threads we'll get into today. But the idea is, is to explore what the physical impacts of a changing climate are likely to be for Canada in terms of economic impacts. Well, how can we bring lots of good work that explores lots of different impacts across the country or potential impacts across the country and translate those risks into economic terms? Next slide, please. So why, why do this? Why tackle this, this challenge? And I, I've heard a lot of people enthusiastic with the project and others that have questioned why the need to do this. We already know that climate change is a big problem. We already know that these risks are serious and significant. Does putting dollar figures 
really move the dial and move the conversation in substantive ways. But we think it does. And we think that part of it is about bringing new interests into the climate change conversation, both around mitigation and adaptation policy, especially interests that speak in the language of economics. So that's business voices, it's departments of finance at different levels of government. That's partly about raising the stakes for those climate change discussions and bringing the, the, the level of those economic impacts home in that different vernacular. But it's also about informing key policy decisions and, and private decisions as well. And those decisions often get framed in the language of cost benefit analyses. This study is a sort of spiritual successor to a, a study from about a, 10 years ago from the National Roundtable in the Environment and the Economy uh, called Paying the Price that tried to do similar things that we're doing here of, of bringing together a range of different physical impacts from climate change and quantifying those economic dimensions of them, what they mean for the economy. That study was, was pretty groundbreaking at the time, but it also had lots of limitations. It relied on integrated assessment models for kind of a top-down approach that had a sort of limited frame, both on the climate side and on the economic side, really relied on just a few major damage functions, aggregated at really high levels, and drawing on international data rather than Canadian data at all times. Uh, it also did some sector specific stuff, but it was narrow and focused and had some limitations in how it tackled those things. So there's a reason why it was limited. This is, this is a hard thing to do analytically and technically, but what we're trying to do is to build on that previous work and, and kind of take the next step. Next slide, please. So our approach is what we're calling a hybrid approach. And this is kind of building on international best practices. Other countries have done similar things. There's a study from Austria in particular that's been uh, kind of very much in this mold. And the idea is to tackle it both from the bottom up and from the top down. So the bottom up is analysis of, of costs and damages from climate change using process-based models, trying to look at the specific science and the details that feed into those different dimensions of damage, whether it's by sector or hazard type or region. And we're, that's the first phase and what I'll talk about mostly today. But it's not the end of the story either. In the second phase, we're gonna do a macroeconomic analysis and feed those inputs from that bottom up set of studies, but also a range of other kind of smaller pieces of analysis and feed them into a macroeconomic model that will look at macroeconomic implications of a changing climate uh, for Canada, uh, but also for regions within Canada. So we'll catch that national story, but also some of the disaggregation that you really need to explore those risks at a sector and regional level. Uh, but by using a macroeconomic model, we can capture both kind of the first and second and third order effects of those physical impacts as they ripple through the economy in interesting and sometimes unexpected ways to capture that full story. Next slide, please. So a, a little bit about those bottom-up analyses and how we are, are tackling those. And I think the, the causal chain here kind of gives you the sense. But the idea is we're taking solid data on future climate projections, including work from uh, Francis's institution, PCAX, that we heard about this morning, uh, to look at what those potential climate projections might be for Canada and for regions of Canada, combining them with socioeconomic projections about where population and, and things like that are going, feeding them into these process-based system models that, that look at specific aspects of a changing climate, uh, and that can give some of the impacts and damages that we expect from those climate shocks, whether that's impacts on physical assets and infrastructure, whether it's on people and health, whether it's on ecosystems or on the economy more directly. We can then use economic techniques and valuation techniques to try to bring some valuation to what those physical impacts might be uh, in terms of economic impacts and in terms of dollar figures and how we can start to feed those into that broader framework that starts to, to tell the story in economic and monetary terms. Next slide, please. So I am, I am no climate scientist and I will not spend too much time here, but I think it's useful to say that we are grounding this work in the solid evidence that people like you and at this conference are, are doing to, to really 
make sure that we are reflecting those the, that that science, the projections of where the climate scenarios are going. A couple scenarios here, uh, a few different time horizons in terms of medium and longer term, and a range of uh, GCM scenarios. Not all of them, not every scenario that that Francis and team produce, but a broad range of them to represent kind of a spread of of uh, pro projections for precipitation and temperature that are particularly relevant to our analysis. Next slide, please. This is a somewhat complicated slide that probably wouldn't work if we were in person, but maybe I'll, because we're virtual, I'll cheat and put it up. This is one of the first things we've, we've done in our study and essentially what it is, we are trying to triage which aspects of physical impacts that we're gonna include in the study. Inevitably, we can't do everything. We can't do a bottom-up study for absolutely every possible climate hazard across every kind of impact field across every region of the country. Instead, we're trying to triage the most important ones. We're trying to identify really significant aspects of climate impacts that we can incorporate in our studies, both in terms of these bottom-up pieces and eventually the top-down piece. And we've done that triage as, as sort of filtering through both on what evidence and research and literature suggests are the most important aspects in terms of the biggest impacts, uh, but also ones that are practically doable for our analysis and analytically tractable and practical to include our analysis. So um, the team calls this the, the Lego blocks of the analysis where we are picking and choosing different Lego, Lego blocks from this matrix and trying to get the most important ones and filter them into our studies and methodologies. Inevitably, that means we will underestimate the cost of climate change for Canada and underestimate the economic risks for Canada. And we'll be putting a sort of lower bound of potential risks, risks rather than a true precise estimate. But we still think it's a very useful thing to do. Even by defining a lower bound, which we think is gonna be quite significant, we can change the narrative and change the way this issue is being talked about in Canada. Uh, okay, so, I think one last thing about the slide that's worth highlighting, I think that in, in a way we, we forced ourselves into a sort of broad literature review of, of what's known and not known about the cost of climate change in Canada and the impacts of climate change in Canada. And one thing that maybe unexpectedly came out as well as a sort of side benefit was the fact that there's, there's also still lots of gaps in the knowledge. There's lots of great work and lots of excellent analysis that starts to shine a light on these risks, but also some holes. There's some sort of unknown unknowns about what the impacts of climate will be. And that starts to take us out of a risk conversation into an uncertainty conversation. And I think that matters in how we frame this conversation around future impacts and future risks as well. Next slide, please. So starting to hone in on where we're putting analytical attention, a few specific pieces that we are putting particular attention on, especially for these bottom-up studies and the first wave of studies. Uh, taking a close look at health uh, across a few dimensions, but in particular at infrastructure. Infrastructure in terms of buildings and real estate, infrastructure in terms of transportation infrastructure, electricity infrastructure, and taking a bit of a regional look as well at the north where we're expecting more warming, more impacts, and starting to explore what those implications might be. Next slide, please. So let me start with that health piece and just a little bit. So the, there's a few categories of economic impacts and economic costs that we're gonna work on. And that'll include direct implications. So that's, we're looking at burdens on healthcare systems from increased illness, increased morbidity from disease, from heat, et cetera. We're also looking at indirect costs. Now those manifest in terms of lost productivity to the economy. The economy is making less strong use of people as labor, as inputs to the economy because of those illness and morbidity impacts. And finally, we're looking at what economists would call a sort of willingness to pay or a disutility impact. And essentially here, it's the statistical value of, of life and well-being and what society is willing to pay, so to speak, to avoid those kind of significant impacts on people's health and people's lives. Lots of overlaps in those different aspects of health uh, impacts and cost impacts. So to be a little careful not to simply add them all up, but they start to shine an interesting light on where those, those impacts are manifesting, not just in terms of, of 
health outcomes alone, but how we can translate those health outcomes into economic factors. Next slide, please. Similar story for the infrastructure. This is our most complicated bottom-up study, and it's taking lots of thinking and lots of different aspects here, especially because we're looking at lots of different kinds of infrastructure. But, but uh, the, as I said, real estate, uh, impacts on roads and transportation uh, infrastructure from roads to airports, electricity grids, that's some interesting overlaps with the net zero work on the mitigation side. Uh, if, you, if you spend time in mitigation world alone, you hear lots about the need for electrification and building up more electricity generation, more electricity distribution, and more electricity use to start to shift away from fossil fuel combustion. But some interesting over interactions. Thanks, Renee. Over interactions there with, uh, with resilience when that infrastructure may actually be exposed to climate shocks in interesting ways. Next slide, please. So I, I will basically wrap up here, but a couple, this is a map of the upcoming publication schedule. So kind of a lay of the land, similar to what I've said here today and in, in the fall, uh, that health bottom up study in towards, towards the early calendar year, infrastructure in the spring, tentatively do that northern one in the summer, and we'll do the macroeconomic piece next fall. Uh, so we have our hands full for sure. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, my name and contact is up here, but I would be remiss not to flag my teammates as well. Ryan Ness is our director of adaptation and speaks to this in, in more uh, authority than I do. And his team of Dylan Clark is also a major player in, in this work as well. So if you do have questions, reach out to me and I may well redirect you to the actual experts. Thank you very much. You're on mute, Gordon. Yeah, sorry. There. Thought I, I clicked it, but anyway, Dale, thanks. Um, we're running really behind schedule. So I think that's been a very interesting presentation. There's been some questions brought up about the issues of adaptation, motivation of organizations and things, but we'll need to follow up those, I think, offline in terms of discussions. I think in view of the time, we need to move on to Natalie Carter's presentation but to say that uh, we'll continue through, as far as I know, I, I can, I'm not gonna turn this thing off until after 2.30 this afternoon. So we wanna stay on. Uh, you can sneak your lunch uh, quickly in when you're between sessions. Um, so I'd like to invite Natalie, who is with the Department of Geography, Environment and Geomatics at the University of Ottawa, who will talk, who's working on the some interesting projects with the well, Inuit and Northern people. And so anyway, over to you, Natalie. Thanks, Gordon. Hello, everyone. I'm so pleased to be part of this session with such um, interesting and informative presentations that have gone before me. Today, I'm going to share with you about our ArcticNet project, which involves collaborative survey development and training to understand Inuit uses and needs for weather, water, ice, and climate information. And this presentation is based on work that Mrs. Shirley Tagalik, the Nunavut coordinator, shown here in the photo on the far right, um, principal investigator Dr. Gita Lubicic in the middle photo, and I, postdoctoral fellow at University of Ottawa and McMaster Uni University, have been doing over the past 1.5 years. Next slide, please. And it's not just us. This is a big team effort. We have 38 team members, in fact and everyone involved in developing and writing our project proposal, please click the slide, as well as local research coordinators more recently hired to lead and conduct the survey in their home communities, and external reviewers from Inuit organizations and government service providers have provided tremendous feedback in our iterative process for developing the questions for our survey. So I want to acknowledge the full team up front. Next slide, please. Our team of Southern and Northern researchers has been working together in different ways for many years. And we have heard and had projects focused on the increasing variability experienced and, ch and challenges this creates for travel safety on the land, which includes water and ice. We've also heard how people use different kinds of information about environmental conditions from within and beyond their community to make decisions about travel safety 
and how many of the services that are currently available are not meeting the needs of remote communities. So we decided to come together in a coordinated approach to community-based research to develop a survey to get feedback in a consistent way from a wide range of people living in communities across Arctic Canada who go out on the land, water, and ice. And our goal is to inform efforts by community organizations, service providers, and decision makers to improve the information and services available to support safe travel in North communi Northern communities. So in this presentation, I'll outline the process we have taken to date involving collaborative survey development and also training 17 local research coordinators who are being supported remotely while independently facilitating questionnaires. And our processes led us to reflect on our approach and methodology we engaged in while undertaking these activities. Um, and our reflections are drawn from assessments of co-facilitated training events, a collective review of field notes, and informal discussions among co-authors and with the local research coordinators and network investigators. So I'll first share a timeline of project activity highlights, followed by a description of the Indigenous research framework that guides the ways in which we conduct this research. And I'll finish by highlighting four key aspects of our collaborative survey design. Next slide, please. And can you click the slide? In December 2018, research partners, Inuit and community organization representatives, government, academia, and Northern community members met to plan and brainstorm about survey content and how best to administer the survey. Please click. By March 2019, a, survey, a draft survey was ready to share with meeting participants and other stakeholders. Please click. Their feedback was incorporated and a second version of the survey was circulated and submitted for ethics review by June 2019. Please click. In September 2019, a third version was finalized, incorporating feedback from research ethic board, ethics boards. Please click. And then in October 2019, the local research coordinators gathered near Montreal, Canada to participate in training and to review the survey. Please click. In November 2019, their feedback was incorporated and the fourth and final version of the survey was submitted for ethics final approval and circulated. Um, and another local research coordinator training event was hosted in Iqaluit, Canada. Please click. Then in December 2019, with ethics approval, local research coordinators started administering the survey in six communities in Nunavut, Canada. And nearly 200 questionnaires were completed. Please click. Then, in March 2020, due to COVID-19 related restrictions, the survey was put on hold and it will, will resume when we get permission to do so safely. Please click. So once the questionnaires are completed, we'll conduct preliminary analyses and then that will be followed by a collaborative analysis workshop. And at that time, local research coordinators and network investigators together will review the preliminary outputs, will conduct additional, additional analyses, and then we'll plan results verification and sharing exercises. Next slide, please. So throughout the collaborative survey design process, team members have identified important ways in which to ensure that the project is collaborative, as well as key considerations for project implementation and management. So, so these included the need to be inclusive and for using the local Inuktitut dialect and carefully selecting who would facilitate the survey. It was important that we use multiple formats to reach a range of people, as well as include a seasonal calendar. It was all, it's also important that we ask relevant and respectful questions and support community research capacity. And finally, that we have an evaluation component as part of the project and report results to different audiences. Next slide, please. So today I'll just be highlighting four of these aspects um, that are shown here in green. The next slide, please. So to begin the discussion about being inclusive, I want to describe the Indigenous research framework that guides the way in which this project was developed and is conducted. The Aikatiginic research framework was developed by elders in Nunavut, Canada, through work with the Akiumavik Society in Akwiat, Nunavut. And Aikatsuginic processes can have different purposes, but common to all of them is the expectation that the end result 
comes from building consensus around an issue and agreement around viable solutions. So Inuit worldview is based on four Malagate or big laws. These include working for the common good, continually planning and preparing for the future, being respectful of all, of all things, and maintaining harmony. Next slide, please. During our training events, local research coordinators identifies ways in which each law applies to the ways in which they would conduct the survey. So here are some examples. Working for the common good, I will prepare and inform people of the goal of the project and work to get buy-in. Being respectful of all things. In hunting, I will share the catch. In research, I will share the results. I will be open-minded, respecting other people's ideas. Continually planning and preparing for a better future. I will connect the project to the bigger picture, and I will be flexible, adaptive, and innovative. Maintaining harmony, I will share knowledge, and I will be open-minded to other people's ideas. Next slide, please. We had an inclusive approach to survey development through involvement of all team members and local research coordinators in review and incorporating feedback through an iterative process. But we also have an inclusive approach through survey implementation. We're inviting youth, men, women, people of different ages and different experiences to participate. Next slide. For instance, in this question where participants rank how often they travel for various reasons, you can see the diversity of options, hunting and fishing in various places, gathering wood, food, stone, collecting water to go to their cabin, guiding or outfitting and for school land trips. And we also provided space for participants to list any other reason they travel. Next slide, please. We heard over and over the importance of respecting and working in the local dialect. So we translated recruitment materials into the local dialect for each community. And local research coordinators, with the help of interpreters in some cases, will translate the survey questions orally as needed. And this allows for important opportunities for clarification. But it also responds to the Ayukatagenic framework, raising awareness and consensus building within the team and in the community for people to be able to be comfortable speaking. Next slide, please. In Inuit Nunangat, Inuit homeland in Canada, different modes of transportation are used in different seasons and different kinds of safety considerations and environmental information are needed for safe travel in different seasons. We wanted to be respectful of Inuit seasonal descriptions, which we had already documented in a number of communities through past initiatives. A challenge arose in that seasons are not the same in each community in terms of timing. And for some communities, they used four seasons and in others, six seasons. In yet others, they didn't feel comfortable assigning season names to certain months. And we really went around in circles on this one with many iterations of how to approach this in respectful ways to accommodate unique seasonal timing, language, and representation. And we were also aware of challenges associated with showing diagrams such as these, as these because not everyone will agree on the seasonal cycle. And in some things, cases, as we've been hearing this morning, have changed so much that older diagrams are not reflective of the past three years the focus of our survey. So in the end, we weren't able to find a good representation that everyone was comfortable with. So we went back to just the months shown in this table. And that will mean options are consistent across communities. The variability of responses will show the unique seasonal travel or timing for each community. And responses will be more representative of travel habits within seasons. For instance, for example, the long winter. Next slide, please. There are several ways in which this project is supporting local capacity. We're working with mentors and local research coordinators who have a lot of research experience in each community. Akumovic Society has a leadership role. Applied, they applied for funding to support all aspects of training and they're administering that funding. We're learning from each other across communities and regions, learning new skills and technology, sharing skills and strengths, and taking a coordinated approach to locally led research. And we're working with local capacity and helping to enhance it by bringing people together to support and learn from each other and aiming to support community leadership and research over the long term. 
So to highlight key elements of the training workshops, we spend time getting to know each other, talking about how weather, water, ice, and climate information are shared in communities now, revising the survey questions and providing feedback. We discussed approaches to raising awareness in the community, practiced the survey, and reviewed details on research ethics and administration. Final slide, please. So on behalf of the project team, I would like to thank ArcticNet for funding this project in a way that supports and enables us to work collaboratively. And I would also like to recognize the many partners who are providing support in so many ways. The hope and goal of our whole team is that this collaborative approach to survey development will yield rigorous, relevant, valuable insights that will enable and support safe travel in Inuit Nunanga. We offer these reflections in order to support future efforts in this emerging capacity enhancement and partnership, partnership approach to research, and also to contribute to ongoing discussion, discussions surrounding capacity enhancement, partnership research, and Inuit self-determination. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if there's time, or please feel free to con contact me at the email address shown here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, very interesting presentation. I'm, uh, I was actually part of ArcticNet for its first decade, and, uh, and it continues to evolve in very fascinating and forward-looking ways, bringing people more involved than we did in our early days. So very good. Um, Thanks, Gordon. I don't see any chat questions, but uh, I think that uh, uh, one of the things that will be interesting to us to see as as the restrictions come off and you complete this survey as to how it uh, well, really uh, shows very interesting things i expect absolutely hopefully we'll have the opportunity to present next year and and share some of that information well that's just exactly what i was going to say <laughs> <laughs> wonderful <laughs> that we'll see you in victoria if not before fantastic uh, we'll see you us, uh, next year Great. I just wanted to say that we're going to try and sh show the video that Don Martin Hill, uh, well, it didn't work well, and we'll see if we can get it working well. And uh, is how uh, setting us up. Yes, we'll go through quickly. Well, we've seen that one. That one went fairly well, I thought. It was. The So it's a virtual reality, not not a video, which I think the, the sound isn't translating very well, which is too bad. Yes, yeah. Maybe you'd like to add it. It was very well interesting, but as you say, hard to fully understand. If you want to add any comments, Don or. Yeah, so just the, um, um, we sent a snapshots. It's a 10 minute interactive, but I think the idea is young people in particular um, to learn how to test water, um, what, what, how to measure what is acceptable guidelines, and merging that with history of the land and the landscape, 
um, treaties so that people understand we're all treaty people and that we have a responsibility to take care of the environment, which is actually in the Dish with One Spoon Treaty that the, um, you couldn't hear the elder talking about. Um, so the idea is to mobilize community, young people, give them the opportunity to see hydraulic modeling and from a virtual interactive space. We're developing holograms of elders um, because so many of our elders get asked to go all over the place to teach or reconciliation and, and really we need them, um, that, that's our library. So trying to find a way to transmit that knowledge to a larger audience about the water. It really is about mobilizing the public and changing behaviors in terms of uh, waste. So similar to what some of the others were saying about reducing um, uh, contamination and activity, uh, taking care of the river uh, better. Um, we have drone footage, we have dancing. So if people wanna see the culture, um, there's actually, because of COVID, we were gonna have uh, all of our community come out and in regalia and talk about how each song has a, you know, like a fish dance. Why do we do that? What is it about? Why are we dancing for the fish? So giving people a greater understanding of how indigenous people don't look at rights to the earth, but rather our responsibility, similar likely to the Inuit, you know, there are core principles that would be explained by elders. Um, we're also gonna have digital stories. We have the mapping with Carlton um, that will be interactive as well. Uh, training on water treatment plant is, is in the works. So it'll become a platform that people can log into um, and, and go in many different directions. But right now, this is the vehicle actually that elders identified, which kind of shocked me a bit, um, that they thought the young population is the one that is getting hopeless about the future, as was mentioned earlier. And we have surveys, we have mental health survey, and, and I, I appreciate the difficulties that the, uh, other project is going through. It's been a two-year process of engaging um, with the survey and I think now because of COVID they want to add more. Um, but the idea is that we work together and that yeah. if you're not sharing this information it's kind of useless. If it's, if it's just an academic journal or a government document it doesn't change behavior and I think that's our goal is to inform young people. Um, there's hope. And, and this is a tool to give, empower them. So it's kind of why we did it. Yes, I think it's very important, as you said, to not only have great papers published in journals, et cetera, but also to communicate with the public to with uh, various groups and things. Uh, I know, I'm sure you do, and uh, many of us on this call, I know from people, names I recognize, uh, do public talks. I give them all over the place. Uh, uh, and I think it not only helps me to understand things, but hopefully by what I'm telling and discussing with them, helps them to better get involved and take action and do things to, in these issues of in climate change, in my case, and disaster risk reduction, et cetera. Um, I just wanna thank you, because I think it's really important um, to have even uh, uh, learn from what other projects are doing with First Nations and an outcome the elders wanted was uh, um, to share, have a space with an audience such as this and scientists, as well as other indigenous collaborations and how, how to access that. And that might be something to consider in the future to have maybe a, a place they could do that next year, um, more people from the community and because they really are very interested in all of this. Uh, this yeah. is Ray. I just want to add that um, you're underselling the sheer difficulty of doing this. Pretty, <laughs> so much of this has to be built from scratch. So, uh, you know, even things like a vial, you have to ray trace, you have to build all of this from basic elements. Uh, I don't know how you managed to do this. I, I, I don't know that I did. <laughs> it's the whole community. Like we literally have the birthing center, the traditional medicine clinic, the health services, fish and wildlife, environment. 
it really is a village and it, it took a village from of scientists because they would say well we want to test turtles and we want to that's the metric for the ecosystem wealth from our point of view and then i had to recruit and i feel you know i often feel sorry for the people i recruit at mcmaster and try to tell them it's going to be challenging and it's it's going to be different so it's a team event and there's at least 40 to 50 if you include the the community researchers um, it is difficult the degree of difficulty and complexity is 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 challenging but i think it's worth it because we're very worried about our future i think that's the the inspiration yeah, well i think the work that natalie was just talking about and oh i mean the sessions within this this theme of of uh, in the case of natalie working with the people in the north the inuit and others uh, is uh, very important in how we bring all of this together and as uh, I don't think you all probably saw one of the chat marks, but uh, there was uh, um, one from my old colleague, John Stone, saying that about the difficulties of getting the, the governments moving ahead on adaptation, and it's a continuing challenge and com combining these things with other issues. So it's uh, very interesting. Um, I think uh, some, well, there's a couple of chats have shown up in the last second. Um, oh, it's from Don, thank you. Uh, Thank you. Work these together, and uh, um, as I said, the uh, we're we're now getting close to the start time officially of the uh, afternoon conference. Can you put up uh, how the uh, the slide for the uh, the 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 opening slide of the sec well the the slide of the second program? It was the second slide of my deck. No, no, it's in part one. I'm sorry. It's the look in part one. Oh, okay. That one. Okay. Anyway, just to say that this afternoon we're going to have a series of presentations um, for those who are watching and listening. Um, well, anyway, Roger Pilvarti, who is uh, uh, Roger is actually was uh, born in the, I think in the, in Trinidad, if I'm right, but certainly in the Caribbean. Um, so Roger will be the opening speaker. He came to Canada and did a degree at York University and then went to the United States and is now one of the leading scientists within the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, leads their drought and water issues. Um, and uh, we've got Paul Kovacs, uh, who will follow, who's the executive director of the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction that I'm part of, and Anna Deeptach Spaff, by Stapp, sorry, who will talk about his. Yes, Anna Deeptach Stapp. Yeah, Correct. Anna Stapp, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Uh, Anna will talk about. Uh, the importance of the National Climate Archive, uh, having reliable data from historical records. Um, Through the mute. And, and they, you, uh, can, you can, uh, Gordon, say that about digitalization and access to the digital resources within yeah. a climate archives. Good. You'll get your chance to present it, but I found it just as, uh, since we're putting in a bit of time yeah. between sessions, yeah. I'll say yeah. One of the important things I realized when I was, for those who are not aware, I was for six years in the 90s, the Assistant Deputy Minister of the Atmospheric Park, the Meteorological Service of Environment Canada in those days. And I always found it very important to recognize the people who over decades, many cases through families of connecting. So they went back literally many, many decades of data, which were often meant, entered in pencil and paper on a piece of, uh, on, on, a, on paper and, and handed in. And after, if they were doing this for 25 or 30 years, we would try and arrange for a local member of parliament or someone to go and give them a personal thank you note in a public way. Then we'll have uh, Rennie uh, Sieber from uh, Geography at McGill University. And we'll talk about communicating weather storms via natural 
uh, language processing of social media. And then we'll get into some really esoteric climate st uh, science stuff from another planet, uh, Paul Godin, who will talk about, uh, you know, well, basically greenhouse effects on in ancient Martian atmospheres. Um, anyway, um, I suggest we, you're allowed now to uh, get, grab a quick coffee and be back in your places in five minutes. We've still got 79 people at the last count. Um, well, I just it allowed two to enter, so we're back. Anyway, we're at roughly 80 people uh, still participating, and we were up to 108 at one point this morning, uh, or at least uh, during the first session. Uh, so, yes. As uh, Natalie had said, if those who aren't reading your chat box, uh, she's saying it'd be great to bring these connections through the work she's been there doing with the workshops at the Five Oaks. Uh, and uh, let's see how we can connect in these kind of things. So let's work on that possibility. So let's uh, leave this slide on until we get to uh, Roger signing in and he, Roger, couldn't join us in the morning because he was giving an important presentation to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. So hopefully he will be showing up soon. I haven't noticed whether he's one of those in the... So let me thank you all those who are still uh, here and listening at all. We've got lots of names I'm recognizing. I won't uh, reveal them all at this point, but it's great to connect with you. Including an important person, my granddaughter and my brother. <laughs>
Uh, Roger, are you on the phone yet? Uh, or online? Welcome, Paul. Hello. Both Pauls, Paul Kovacs and Paul Godin. We got two Pauls this afternoon. Sorry, I was noticing Paul's picture came on first before yours, Paul Godin. Um, We're now back up to 86 people. Is any of these Roger Pilvarti? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anna, you need to mute yourself. <clears throat> this is Renee, your timekeeper. Yes. <laughs> She's keeping track of everything. Thank you, Renee. Well, um, um, in view of the time, um, maybe Paul Kovacs, if you're available, uh, willing, could you start early and we do Paul Kovacs session presentation first, and hopefully Roger will have joined us by then. Um, so we're going to have Paul Kovacs, uh, he's smiling, so and his muting's off. So if we could pull up the presentation of Paul Kovacs, that's the one, who will be talking about using science to build resilient communities. Paul is the um, executive director of the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction, an economist by background, uh, affiliated with Western University as well. And so over to you, Paul. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to present today, and uh, thanks to everybody who's making the time to be part of the session. Um, if you can move to the next slide, please. So in the time available, I'm gonna quickly cover a couple different topics. So first, I wanna talk about the state of play. Uh, we're talking about uh, how science can promote resilience. Uh, so how are we doing in Canada? And then uh, three broad opportunities for promoting resilience. One is uh, reducing existing risk, but another is trying to stop risk creation. And a third is uh, promoting resilience during recovery. Uh, so those are the topics I'm gonna cover uh, rather quickly in the time today. If we move to the next slide. So the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction, as Gordon mentioned, we're based at Western. Uh, we're the leading disaster research institute in Canada. Uh, we get about half of our funding from uh, private insurance companies, but about half of it comes from uh, the federal and provincial governments. And we're an international center of excellence in um, integrated research on disaster research. Uh, next slide. Okay, state of play, how are we doing? Uh, so uh, I'm gonna quickly go through a couple different metrics, but the overall message on how are we doing? Uh, first, um, our efforts to deal with disasters and reduce the risk is below that of the countries we compare ourselves to a little bit. Uh, our efforts to try to keep fatalities down is been doing very well. Uh, we're amongst the lowest in the world and it's been falling. Uh, damage uh, is high, is, is low, but it's been rising. And uh, an overall message on state of play is that uh, there's an unacceptable level of damage and it's preventable. So if I can go through a couple of slides, but this is the overall message. So on to the next slide. Um, so this is a crafted piece I've done using some data from United Nations University. They uh, somewhat bravely came up with a sense of inherent risk. What would be the risk of flooding, wildfires, earthquake, a uh, number of different hazards um, if we weren't doing anything about it. Uh, they also have uh, their data on uh, actual outcomes. And so the difference I'm calculating is uh, an attempt 
to, uh, by different countries to reduce the risk. So what this metric finds and what anecdotally most of us in the field believe, Japanese work much harder at this than we do. The Americans work harder at this than we do. Uh, we're not that far behind many of the countries to compare ourselves to, but we are somewhat behind the Americans and the Europeans. We're well behind what the Japanese are doing in terms of effort to reduce the risk of various different hazards. On to the next slide. Um, the data available, uh, looking at the number of people who have died in Canada resulting from floods welfare, is very, very low. Low compared to the countries we usually compare ourselves to. We've done well in terms of avoiding fatalities. Uh, the only hazard I've left out of this, because it's a, I'm not sure there's much agreement on how to measure it, is fatalities due to extreme heat. Uh, but looking across all the other hazards, um, our metric compared to the countries we would want to compare ourselves to, we're doing well. Um, this is not the um, outcome that is uh, the problem for us over the last while, but there are definitely risks in Canada from uh, people who, who occasionally do lose their life, but there are health issues related to fires and smoke. Uh, extreme heat, I mentioned, is, is a little challenging to, to measure, um, and that's definitely a concern that's rising. So there are some health concerns, but uh, the overall metric for Canada is quite good. The next one. Uh, here's a graphic from United Nations University looking at uh, disaster damage in various countries around the world. Um, Africa and Southeast Asia just stand out as experiencing a lot of damage relative to the size of the economy. Canada is ranked among the very lowest, uh, along with most of the European countries. We're outperforming the um, Americans and several other countries we compare ourselves to, but we're definitely in the grouping of less damage overall. Uh, so good news. But the next slide. Uh, this is a trend of payments made by Canadian insurance companies because of disasters. Uh, on the bottom is a fairly normal scale over 40 years, but on the left, it's a logarithmic scale. So um, uh, again, these numbers are kind of scary how quickly they've been going up and how consistently they've been going up over a long period of time. Uh, that uh, the damage in Canada is relatively low compared to some parts of the world, but it's trending up and it's a fairly uh, established and sustained trend of uh, increased losses in some places where we measure consistently like data from insurance companies. On to the next slide. Uh, this is a slide Gordon used earlier uh, that we've generated. So if you take the payments by insurance companies, use that to try to get an overall sense of direct damage in society as a whole, including all losses. Um, you see some years that stand out, like a fire in Fort McMurray or a uh, flooding in Calgary or an ice storm, but there's a trend that seems to be going on. A fair amount of variability in the numbers, but a trend that's rising, and we're getting losses uh, of direct damage uh, in Canada from all kinds of climate-related risks uh, of about four to six billion a year, and this has been rising rather rapidly for some time. So we're on a trend that, unless we do something about it, unless we do promote resilience, uh, the numbers have become uh, uh, uncomfortably high and we're on a trend that's uh, continued to rise to levels that uh, uh, these extraordinary events we've seen in the past will become typical of, of uh, uh, what we might see every year. Okay, moving on. So the, the first uh, uh, objective was to get a quick overall sense of state of play. How are we doing? Uh, what are some of the science-based options to do something about this? So um, of the three broad options I'm going to share, one of the hardest is how do you reduce existing risks? Uh, for physical damage, the part that I've been focused on, this is perhaps the hardest one. Uh, the buildings have been built, the infrastructure is in place. How do you reduce the risk for uh, existing structures? Uh, so a couple of broad tools that science can help us. Um, mapping, so do we know where the maps are? Um, uh, modeling, and getting behind what are the root causes. This is getting into behavior on other, other issues. And finally, uh, empowering the public at large so that uh, uh, you're not uh, putting all the responsibility or expecting one group to take the lead. You want to, as broadly as possible, empower people to make their own choices and improve their resilience. So again, really quickly going through these tools for reducing existing risks, how can science help? The first, next slide, please. Um, in this country, we have a fairly advanced set of tools on hazard mapping. 
we know where extreme rainfall has happened. We know where tornadoes have happened. We know where earthquakes have happened, wildfires, whatever the hazard would be. Uh, we've got a, a pretty rigorous history at this kind of level to get a sense where things have been. Um, as part of the conversations earlier um, by Francis and others, uh, these risks are evolving and changing. So uh, knowing history is useful, but it's not a sense of where we want to go and we can do better. And also hazard mapping is different than risk mapping. Um, and risk mapping is critical for reducing risk. So um, uh, science has moved us partway along the way here with hazard maps and, and they're pretty good. But the next step is to get to risk maps and risk models. So on to the next slide. Uh, here's just one visual illustration. This happens to be Peach Lake in central British Columbia, Peach Land in central British Columbia. Uh, a wildfire went through this community. The house on the left is fine. The house on the right is gone. And um, having a general map saying there's fires in central British Columbia wasn't good enough. Uh, what were the behaviors of the homeowners on the left that made their home resilient? And what are the specific actions done for the home on the right so that it was destroyed? Uh, that's some of the science needed, the further research is needed. That's beyond studying fires and, and research, which is critical, understanding the behavior of fires but this is understanding how individuals take care of their own property, et cetera. Um, it makes a difference between total destruction and a home that looks like it's fine to move back into. On to the next slide. Uh, on the behavioral side, this is one of Gordon's favorites. Um, so there's a terrible tornado coming and this fellow's cutting his lawn. Um, I'm not sure, Gordon, if there's a debate whether this was an actual photograph or this was doctored or whatever. I uh, don't want to get into that, but the, the point of the slide that I was trying to share is that um, understanding how people behave is an emerging science where science can definitely help decision makers uh, get behind why do some people do reckless things, why do some people do the right things, how do you properly communicate the science uh, once you get a consensus about the right things to do. Um, and our community as a science community can better work on behavioral science, decision science, so that we can effectively communicate uh, risk reduction. On to the next slide. Uh, again, I'm trying to be quick here. Uh, our institution, we have a number of different documents we put out. This is trying to empower homeowners. Go to our website, read this, I hope, um, and say for this hazard, here's how you can walk around your own home and know whether you do or do not have a risk. And uh, if you have a risk, here's some things you could do about it. And, and again, the broader goal that uh, some of us are trying to do in terms of risk reduction is just to empower as many people as possible. If we can get uh, more than 10 million homeowners who understand and can think about their own risk, then uh, you don't have to wait for someone to do that for you. You should be able to look after yourself. On to the next slide. The second broad option, first one is reducing existing risk. The second one. Uh, Gordon McMahon and I were part of the um, efforts to come up with the Sendai framework. One of the outcomes, in my opinion, of the science behind global research about what's happening around the world, where worldwide we're having more problems, is that uh, our society and others around the world are doing a really bad job of preventing risk creation. Um, and here, the economics as an economist are amazing. For a very small amount of money, you can avoid a lot of risk, but we're not doing a very good job at this. Anyway, some of the broad tools available, building codes, um, better planning by local governments, and designing infrastructure from the get-go so that it's ready for uh, current risks and future risks. So I can quickly go through these tools. On to the next one. Uh, so our institution, we've been trying to go to the government and talk to them about how building codes for new homes, which are three to four times more likely to experience damage than commercial structures. So what, what's the issue related to homes? Uh, we've been trying to promote uh, tools and things that could be put in the building code that will reduce the risk when a new home is new built. Uh, on the left is a backwater valve, in the middle are tie down straps that uh, keep a roof from blowing off in a strong wind event, and on the right is testing so that a roof doesn't start on fire when there's a, a wildfire ember landing on a roof. Um, this is doing science to try to inform the options available so that when you build new structures, they are less risky and they are designed for today and hopefully tomorrow's um, extreme risks in an affordable, cost-effective way. On to the next slide. Uh, mapping. 
So this happens to be a community in New Brunswick, and uh, this is an attempt to give more and more information to that community. Here's areas of high risk, here's areas of low risk, here's how it might be evolving over time. Uh, try not to have people build in areas of high risk, and that needs to be informed, and you need to put out maps. This is a hazard map, but it's also moving toward being a risk map because it's superimposing where people are. Um, and informing decision makers using science about how to plan a community so that you anticipate future, future risks and, and current risks. On to the next slide. Um, one of the most famous uh, exercises was the uh, floodway built to protect Manitoba. Uh, relatively small investment has done enormous benefit in terms of avoiding and preventing flood damage. This is um, uh, taking action uh, in advance so that you can make a community better prepared going forward. Uh, the floodway is perhaps the best known uh, example, but there's a lot of opportunity across the country to uh, take our infrastructure, take our protected devices, design them to anticipate current extreme risk, but also future risk going forward. On to the next slide. Uh, the last area I want to talk about as I move toward closing. Um, when we do have bad events, we have to rebuild and recover. And that is a great opportunity to do it right and to do it better. Uh, most of the money to rebuild houses and commercial buildings comes from private insurance. Most of the money to rebuild public infrastructure comes from governments. Governments also have an opportunity to uh, provide broader support and incentives during the rebuild process. Uh, our work finds that there's generally a window of a year, maybe a year and a half, uh, if a community and decision makers are ready to go, there's a, a positive environment, there's a willingness, there's usually a lot of money around, uh, but that closes quickly. So the, the international conversations, Gordon and I were off at some meetings in Japan last year and the year before uh, to follow up on Sendai. Uh, if you want to build back better and you want to fit into this window of opportunity, you have to do the planning before the disaster. You have to have anticipated and planned for a disaster, uh, which is not easy for a community or for a government to do. Um, but for the very large serious events around the world, it is possible. The Japanese and the Americans have showcased how to do that. And ICLR is certainly trying to promote that. Uh, within our country, um, hats off to the government of British Columbia that I think is the furthest along of thinking about these sorts of things and trying to encourage more communities to think in advance about really serious events and how they would want to recover because it sets the stage for all kinds of things like relocating properties at risk um, and a variety of things. So on to the next slide. Um, here's uh, the mayor of um, uh, High River, Alberta. Uh, in his quote, he's saying High, Ro High River, Alberta is the most prepared community in Canada for flooding. Well, before 2013, that was not how High River was described by anybody, not even the mayor. High River was a community that flooded quite often, but they chose to use the experience, the terrible experience of the flooding in 2013 to greatly change their community and confront flood risk and build it back in a very different way. Um, this is your five minute warning. Thank you. Um, and so this is an illustration of a community that took on a hazard and addressed it full heartedly and has greatly reduced the risk because they made it a priority. On to the next slide. Uh, uh, part of, again, a broad sharing that I would have. Uh, the, on the Build Back Better area, uh, when most hazards are relatively small, you can't really do large change. It's the uh, being prepared for the worst circumstance. This is thinking of a really bad hazard. And if something like that occurs, you could have planned for that. You can be ready in advance. And you can really make a big difference when you rebuild. So um, it's, it's in this uh, extreme event analysis that Build Back Better has the greatest potential to make a difference. On to the next slide. Uh, so to close, um, the uh, Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction uh, has been involved for more than 20 years now in trying to work on science-based solution to build resilient communities. Um, we think that uh, there are very large and rising losses occurring in our country, four to six billion dollars a year of direct damage to homes, to businesses, to uh, public infrastructure. And much of those losses are preventable based on the science that's currently available. Um, but it is hard to take existing science and use it to reduce the risks that are in place right now. Uh, but science 
should be and can be a foundation for reducing existing risks. Um, there is enormous potential for preventing the creation of additional risk. Building codes, planning, et cetera, are tools that are available. Uh, but there is a, uh, experience in this country and around the world that we're not doing as well as we could on preventing risk creation. And that's perhaps been the largest challenge to bring the numbers to continue to get worse and worse because we have not done more to confront risk creation. Um, and uh, we are definitely trying to uh, advance discussion about building resilience and recovery. We're working with member insurers to talk with uh, insurance companies so that the, when they put a home back, they put it back better. Um, and that's not straightforward. That's a conversation we're having with them. And uh, we believe that governments can play a much bigger role in terms of promoting um, uh, building back better. So Gordon, thank you for the opportunity to share. Uh, if time permits, I'd be delighted to take any questions, but again, just trying to share the broad message. Science can definitely help promote resilience, and here's some specific examples. Thanks, Gordon. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Um, there was a question from Dawn Martin-Hill. Did you want to ask it, Dawn, or should I read what you sent? <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, just a second. Just to say that, uh, what Don was suggesting was the probably the connecting better, you know, with the Inuit communities and the First Nations communities, um, indigenous knowledge, you know, how do we've done, how they've done things in the past. Uh, anyway, we can uh, be worth having a chat. <laughs> yeah, Don, I'd love to work with you. Uh, we think that there's a lot of really important knowledge. The, the one that uh, we profiled to some extent on our last webinar, we do monthly webinars that are free if you come to ICLR and watch for them. Dealt with wildfires. Okay. And uh, we talked about uh, if you plant aspen instead of uh, uh, spruce or whatever, how that would reduce the risk around a community. Um, anyway, there's, there's many opportunities on a variety of fronts. Wildfire is just one, but uh, flooding and, and other hazards. Uh, uh, there's an opportunity to take from that knowledge base and include it in terms of best practices. So thank you. Great. Okay, let's just let me say that Roger is now online, so we'll start with him in a minute, but we'll give, uh, since Paul gave us a nice talk, uh, Trevor, James, Trevor Smith asked the question, how do we address the narratives that, that people say, well, other issues are more pressing when we should be looking in <laughs> risk reduction? So um, my, my opinion is that uh, it is appropriate that climate-related risks, disaster-related risks should be brought into a broad risk uh, conversation by individuals, by companies, by governments, and they should be judged relative to other risks. So uh, right now the pandemic has moved to the front of the list and there's things we're doing about the pandemic that uh, you know we weren't doing last year or the year before uh, because it's the risk that it's a risk that needs to be addressed right now. Um, so the the case needed to be made requires an economic analysis, I'd argue that as an economist, um, an understanding of the risk, but it should be brought into a broader risk management framework. Uh, in private industry, there's uh, people like chief risk officers, and that's why I think commercial damage has been much, much lower than residential and, and um, damage to public infrastructure, because there's a formal process in companies where this, if it's a serious risk, comes to the forefront and it's addressed. Um, and for governments to embrace this in a risk management process is a healthy thing. It's starting to emerge more and more. And, um, and so the case needs to be made within a, a proper comparison. Where do these risks compare relative to other risks? And if they deserve attention, they should get it. If they can't make their case, then the money should be spent elsewhere. Good, thank you. Um, so if uh, how could bring up uh, Roger Povarty's presentation, I'll just say that the, the question was asked about the, whether that was a real picture of uh, the guy mowing it in the tornado it was. I went on uh, media and others to say, for God's sakes, media, don't publish those pictures because we have too many times the media like to respond to people who want to get themselves on the national news and for anything, they'll walk in front of a tornado or in some cases put their kids out in front of a tornado and take movies of them. So enough of that. Let me say that Welcome, Roger. Uh, his session with the U.S. National Academy of Sciences went beyond schedule, but he's now here. His presentation is up, and uh, Roger, as I said earlier, is a senior scientist with the NOAA Physical Labs Laboratory. He has the pleasure of working in Boulder, Colorado, but he's a graduate of York University earlier in his career. Yeah. So, welcome, <clears throat> you. 
Great, thanks very much, Gordon, and thanks to everyone for being on. Apologies for being late. I, I will add that the first paper I ever published was with Stuart Cohen in the CMOS Bulletin a long time ago on climate and food security. So this, it's great to come full circle. Um, so I'm gonna speak a little bit as, as, as some of the questions that were raised. Well, okay, what if things are more pressing? What, how are we thinking through things? How do we engage people? And in that setting, talk a little bit about how we go from risk to resilience, not forgetting that we need to deal with acceptable risk day-to-day -day activities surrounding specific hazards, but also how we work, integrate and use science better on this continuum from risk to long-term resilience. A click, please. So change is ahead. We all know that. As I like to say, you don't need to be the Dalai Lama to know that change is ahead. But so is uncertainty. Uncertainty is avoidable, unavoidable and as we move forward over time. Um, I'm going to ask whether or not the uncertainty can actually stop us from action and what makes us uh, take risks in the face of uncertainty. Next. So changes in weather and climate events. We know this to be the case, certainly in our setting. Um, this is a picture from the special report on extremes. Gordon and I were involved in that in the IPCC. It is the most widely used IPCC report. And there's good reason for that, for the questions being asked by this panel. Click, please. So here's the National Academy from the US um, report on, on uh, S2S, uh, well, subseasonal to seasonal risk, but also on what we know about attribution on event types. Up on the far right, you can certainly know, we know something about extreme heat, we know something about extreme cold. But when we get down to the lower levels of uncertainties and our confidence by attributing changes, up come severe convective storms, extra tropical cyclones, wildfires, tropical cyclones, extreme snow, extreme rainfall. Together with that, click please, are is an understanding that we don't simply respond to one event at a time. We respond to multiple events at multiple time scales, and these require different efforts and different kinds of investments. So adaptation spans multiple activities and scales, click. And we have been able to document worldwide that, that where some things are being done in agriculture, in energy, in hydropower, reservoir management, click please, and in which we can actually talk about with businesses such as AECOM, IBM, UN, through the UNDR process, what is needed, what types of impacts do we look at on sub-decade, on decadal, on months to years, weeks to months, and years and sub-decades. And this is a really critical way of looking at issues, but what I want to get at is that in an increasingly complex, complex world, while we think of a linear risk process as dealing with the impact and the response and the assessment on each of these time scales, it is the actual interaction of the time scales that is creating our complexity. And, and we all know that the question is, how do we deal with it? Click please. So there are great benefits. Early warning systems were shown by the World Bank, saves lives and assets worth at least 10 times their cost. Um, we were able to show how this worked in the Caribbean during the 2017 uh, massive hurricane season, but also how it helped in the 2013 to 2016 drought event. We know that investing money on better dryland farming yields a certain benefit. We know investments enable more efficient use of water brings benefits and $1 trillion. And, and these are round big numbers, right? And a, a lot done by Stefan Halgat and others um, would generate $4 trillion in benefits. I'm not going for the accuracy, but the scale of this one to four, the idea that some upfront investment can save us into the long term, but how long is the long term when tomorrow is the thing that matters? Next slide. So I, I was the convening lead author on adaptation, uh, both in the last IPCC, but also for the US National Assessment. And we documented a lot of activities and responses since the third national assessment in 2014. This is from the 2018 report that I was involved in as well. Implementation has increased, but it's not yet commonplace. It is very similar to Paul's question of, well, if we know what we ought to do and we have the tools and we understand some of the costs, why aren't we acting? So this becomes very critical because in the next click, the report for the Sustainable Development Goals, I chair SDG 6 on water for the US, says something similar. Pathways to generate the transformation required to meet these goals are not yet advancing at the speed or scale required, even though we know what we ought to do. There's impacts and actions. So next click. So we know there will be more outbreaks as a consequence of extreme weather, biodiversity destruction, and political instability. 
That sounds like COVID-19, but that statement is actually, click please, from a book called Fire in Paradise on the California fires, the most destructive natural hazard, probably in, uh, even more so in terms of economics than Katrina um, and Hurricane Sandy and so on. And we estimate that it's about $80 billion just in California alone. So we know that the collective timescales and the interactions of both the risk and the uncertainties produces what we call systemic risk. Next slide. So what we're trying to do is get at not just responding to simple risk, which is critical. Uh, it looks like it's wet outside. We might be slipping before we step outside. Got to carry umbrella, got to get better shoes. The complicated risk, we are seeing hotter droughts impacting vegetation to complex compounding and cascading risk. And this has become common to talk about, but not yet common in terms of how we respond to some of these very complex risks. And traditional risk management and management strategies are increasingly challenged by the nature of these systemic and evolving impacts of the cross time scales aspect of climate. So what do we do about them? That uh, figure on calculated and perceived risk was in the special report on extremes. And it was one of the first times we tried to get our heads around how do we manage from droughts to floods to wildfires and back. Next slide. So here's one example, and we're drawing this out in the, um, I'm one of the convening authors on the global uh, assessment report for the UN uh, Office of Disaster Risk Reduction. And Gordon's work a long time with them. There's globally networked risk. Modern food systems are highly dynamic, complex, formal, and informal. And you can see the main trade flows of corn, wheat, soybean, complex, and palm oil. Coffee is even more complex than that. Next slide. But what we're seeing is the current context, the stressors, sudden and gradual tipping points, and systemic failures in some cases. Environmental degradation, uh, agricultural technical limits, the complexity of trade, Water conflicts, uh, is somehow over um, you know, trade and demand, uh, market volatility, giving rise to impacts in different parts of the world. Years ago, we did a study on the, um, the impact of uh, droughts in the middle of the United States, building on the 1950s event. And basically since then, when there's a major drought in the US, the US itself is no longer affected directly as they were in the 1930s, but it's the places that import cheap wheat from the US that begins to be affected, and the trade-offs in the market with Canada, Brazil, and elsewhere. So this is a globally networked way of looking at risk and failure. But another part of systemic risk, next slide, has to do with how we optimize what we're looking at. We're optimizing for stability. This system, even though it looks like that, is actually assuming stable environments. That's how we do our trade. That's how we do our movement of cash flow. That's how we do our shipping up and down the Mississippi. Right now, we're in the middle of working with the Mississippi mayors on trying to manage upper Midwest flooding, a hurricane season that looks like it's going to be extremely active and it started that way, with how the mayors in New Orleans and Baton Rouge will manage emergency shelters, planning, and so on in a time of a pandemic. This is a very complex set of driven features from more than one type of extreme. Next slide. But these globally networked risks also drive and play a role in local imbalances. We work quite a bit on with the, the way indigenous peoples in the US are developing uh, climate change impacts and planning, but sometimes click, the drivers are huge. The increased temperature and dryness in the Four Corners, the Southwest, where the Diné people, the um, Hopi, Wallapai, and so on are, we're seeing increased sand dune migration. And in addition to that, the dust from those sand dunes going onto the snowpack on the Southern Rockies, causing early melt and so on. So a colleague, close colleague of mine from Northern Arapa says, with drought, tribes are the first affected. They're the ones on the ground who sustain themselves with subsistence, hunting, fishing, and gardening. Many of the folks living in that region while facing these threats are also looking at how novel ecosystems are arising and how new plants and practices and engage, become engaged in their cultural practices to the extent that some of the things that were developed in the Four Corners region on riparian control of erosion is now you being used by the city of Albuquerque. So you have impacted people, but also people who are impacted and showing what they've done over the long term to learn and manage risk. Some of these local imbalances are driven by larger scale dynamics of droughts and floods globally. 
that are related to those systemic risks. Next slide. So if we know what to do, why aren't we doing better? Now this comes from a mentor of mine uh, from years ago, a guy by the name of Gilbert White. And Gilbert um, used to ask the question, if we know better, why aren't we doing better? Now we're doing a lot of things that are better. I showed some cases in which um, in the US and some examples globally from the Ad Global Adaptation Coalition on where things are being done. But as Paul was just mentioning, we have those and we have cases and we have some examples, but we are not thinking about how we address these as a broader society outside of projects. One of the reasons is that like the Financial Times said, people are afraid that doing something about climate will or make them poorer or less well off. That's the first thing that put up there. I call this, we, we like to think, you know, that the knowledge deficit shouldn't be a barrier to us action. This is a deficit of admitting what the problems are. So next slide. So if we only knew the cost and benefits, we would ask, we would act differently, or so we think. Or as the young person says, if we learn from our mistakes, shouldn't we be making as many mistakes as possible? So the question is, is it true that if we know the costs and benefits that that will actually help us to act? Next. Here's a study. I was involved in the review process on this for Natural Hazard Mitigation Save, the 2017 Assessing Future Savings from Risk Mitigation. Please just click. So wildland urban interface, we know investing $1 can save 3 to $4. We know river for rivering flooding, one can save 5 to $7. One to five for winds and for hurricane surge, one to seven. So we know the benefits of investing a dollar upfront, but why are our comment actions not completely commensurate with knowing that cost and benefit? Next slide. And one of the reasons why is the choice that we have to make about land use planning and design. Novel configurations of land use is actually the biggest return on investment. And those are the hardest policy decisions to make. It's easier just to say, let's retrofit. And even then we don't do it at the scale that's needed. So let's keep that in mind that we've shown the fact that the cost and benefits, actually we know something about it and adaptations do not, let's go back, go back, please. Okay, next slide. And in addition to those investments, adaptations do not always require major investments. Here's a simple set of efforts. Actually, we have some going up on like this, just above the hill where I live in Boulder, Colorado at the time. We're introducing beavers basically to get at strengthening watershed functions. And we're seeing good cases in which this happens. This is a very simple, very direct effort. And all of these scales matter, both the investment for things like hurricane surge and the level at which these actions take place. So there's a mix of actors, public, private, academia, and civil society mechanisms. Those are the people that are actually doing this work. Next. Next. So here's another thing we say, if we could only assess future risks with greater certainty. Well, there's an old Chinese, Chinese proverb that says, if we're not careful, we'll end up where we are going. How certain do we need to know the future with what great precision when you look at a map like this and you could say, I think I know where this is going in terms of water demand, in terms of uh, food uh, import issues and so on. So next. Next. Right. This is one study done, I mean, not even a study, this was actually an implementation long before the California drought, done by Paula Kehoe from the San Francisco Public Utility, and she and I wrote up a piece on the risks that people take trying to do things up front. But in this case, that is a real picture that you're looking at, both of them. And you could see the top of the San Francisco uh, Transportation Building, up to 95% of demands are non-potable in commercial buildings. In the last five years, every new building, major building in San Francisco, over 250,000 square feet, big office buildings, transportation hubs, now have to have a green top. And that green top is agreed to by the health sector, by the health department, by transportation, by a network of people working to maintain the protection of the green roof. So there are opportunities to rethink our building design and reimagine how water is used that actually are not sometimes put into place when we constantly think, okay, until we know the future, exactly, we shouldn't be acting. Yet this was put into place in California and some of our other cities are trying to do this now. Next slide. But there's a bigger sort of issue around those drivers. If we look at this figure, which is in um, the National Climate Assessment, I was also on the water chapter, um, 
since done by Peter Rogers, then Peter Glick took up some of the data and then we put it in the national assessment in the effort we were, we were doing. Since 1995, the, you know, the amount of water withdrawals in the United States has leveled off. The total amount of water use, not just per capita, not just, this is the total amount of water withdrawals and use is actually leveling off. Look at the US GDP. Do you see a big impact on having made these actions? You can't. And this is one of the cases, and we see it in energy as well, in which we can basically say, look, a set of actions have taken place and efficiency and better productivity from smaller amounts of water use did not in fact impact our well-being in the way the Financial Times was saying people were saying it would be. So click. So efficient technology was introduced since about 1973. There was the Clean Water Act for managing things a little bit more, the quality that you get and what you can recycle and use and behavioral changes in terms of efficiency. And these are well documented. And the most important thing there is there's the leveling off and we cannot show that there's been a loss of economic competitiveness, which is usually the dodge that's put up for action. Next slide. What's the next thing? Well, if only we get the communication right. Communication is critical, but it is not sufficient. The combination of supply and demand for information is not linear in terms of what do you want and how can I provide it, even if it's wrong, and is more than two way. The tougher thing to do, next slide, in communication, next, is understanding how the different people and institutions who work with socialize their lessons from the past, precisely as uh, Paul and others were, was saying. This is a figure I drew years ago uh, from a set of studies um, that Kathy Jacobs and I did on just the difference uh, through interviews and otherwise, there's the water manager's perspective, and we're generalizing about that, and there's a researcher's perspective. Completely different answers on critical issues, time frames, spatial resolution, goals, basis for decisions, expectation, product characteristic, and the entire frame. Years ago, we understood, yes, water managers and others have their frame. Energy folks, community builders, but so do researchers. And so we need to basically understand when we go into such settings, Various the communication also includes us. Next slide. The other thing we do is, you know, coming out of the forecasting community and given the many uncertainties, you say, well, predict, then act. This nice figure on the top is from a study by Rob Lempert that I've added to. He and I are working on a set of this idea of if the uncertainties are underestimated because of complexity, competing analyses then contribute to gridlock, and I see it in and yeah, when we deal with the public, as, as Gordon knows, we do, from every level to con from Congress to local levels. And misplaced concreteness about the future can increase decision makers' vulnerability to surprise. So as a result, it's easy to underestimate the complexities of adaptation. Or well, as Nostradamus might have said, I did not see that coming. But if we actually understand the uncertainty, or if we understand the context by which we make decisions, it is not truly a surprise. So where does that leave us? Click. It tells us that factoring resiliency in systems design and planning is still the safest approach from risk to resilience. And we need a shared concept and indicators that drives us and links the continuum between risk-based, probabilistic risk-based approaches and those that are there to help us manage uncertainty and resilience. As we like to say, we're not simply managing for change, we have to manage through change. Next. So moving forward, where are we? Integrated approaches to managing risk and resilience and the use of windows. We have to acknowledge the cross-scale nature of early warning information that goes from the emergency response to thresholds and surprises. The fact that in systemic risk, in our global trade network, in our uh, communications network on energy, on water, there are stability domains that we are assuming exist and we saw them disrupted and we are seeing them disrupted at the moment. There's entry points and opportunities for information and interventions. And so our partnerships lead us to think through how to get at that. And I think that's the brilliance of these two sessions that um, Gordon put together, is that trying to get at, yes, if we have these thresholds, stability domains, and cascading risk, what are our entry points for opportunities and inf intervention? Next slide, please. Where might investments be prioritized to reduce future risk across the continuum? not just in response to something that has happened or simply planning for something like what has already happened. Next. 
The best metrics approach thinking through resilience is to look for the long-term benefits of addressing near-term risk. Next slide. And how we think through some of this, and th this is in a paper that uh, Igor Linkov uh, from the Corps of Engineers, myself and a bunch of other folks did on Five how minutes. we create a tiered approach to, yeah, thank you, to linking risk and, and um, resilience, the physical, informational, cognitive, and social aspects. Click. Click. Across how we prepare. Okay, back. Back, please how we pre go across, prepare, absorb, recover, and adapt. So as we take our different things from home, neighborhood, town, county, region, state, country, and even country regions, we think about, okay, the informational basis across all of these from physical to social, cognitive, and information in the different stages of preparing, absorption, recovery, and adaptation, and each of the entry points for finance. And I, we have a lot of work going on with the World Bank and others on where the liquidity needs to be placed to get the most benefit. Next slide. So the actor network in all of that needs broadening. Public and private sector, yes. Academia, yes, but also civil society. To ensure political authority and policy coherence, next. To develop the culture of partnerships beyond, with a social basis for risk communication, next. To decentralize step by step while maintaining accountability, efficiency, and standards. Next. And to get us past this simplified notion of co production, which usually leads to co optation. In other words, we co produce with one group and then marginalize others. Partners do not just share data, they also share risks and responsibilities. And it is for this reason um, we developed the Regional Integrated Sciences um, Assessment Program, which now has 11 um, research entities funded for five years. Um, each time, run by uh, folks in academia, but bringing in public, private, and local folks in each region, so that they are not just simply saying, give me your data and analyze it and give you back a, a, the paper and we will have co-produced, but we are actually sharing the risks and responsibilities in your region. Next slide. And so arrangements for how individuals and institutional learning and co-production can occur without co-optation. That's the big challenge. Next slide. So in beginning to think through this, what is the fundamental question of adaptation? The fundamental question is not simply, as I like to say, you know, perfect planning is a figment in the mind of the planner, right? I have this plan today, it's gonna last forever. Well, of course not. The fundamental question is how often should criteria for robustness be reconsidered and tested? Next slide. And one, one figure we took in the National Climate Assessment um, for 2018 in the US was trying to map where we've seen awareness, assessment, planning, implementation, monitoring and evaluation goes forward through the different adaptive cycles and how leadership partnerships and stakeholders are engaged. And so it's iterative because that's the nature of collaborative learning for emergent risks. Last, next slide. So, oh, sorry, uh, the one thing I do want to mention is one piece that was coming up in the previous talk as well we're looking very closely at how we get systematic alignment. That is the shared visions, implementation and financing among the Paris, the UNFCCC agreements, click. The 2030 agenda for SDGs and click. And the first full post-Sendai um, assessment for the UN Dis Office of Disaster Risk Reduction, taking the plans for disaster risk reduction and the assessment, integrating across risk to resilience, hopefully, but to 2030, not for some long further out issue. Can we get there? And how do we align the funding, implementation and financing on the disaster risk to climate adaptation continue? Next slide. And how it's fun, the, the Addis Ababa Action Agenda is basically part of the discussion on how it might be financed. And we can talk about that in, during the question period as well. Next. So what's our final challenge? is to sustain the collaborative learning networks across research, observation, services, and decision-making. As Gordon showed, we have the notion of linked risks, and these have not changed for a long time in the World Economic Forum reports. We've drawn out pathways of action that can lead us to increasing systemic risk or decreasing paths, depending on where we go. And the fundamental challenge for the research community 
is ensuring that monitoring, observations, forecasting, impacts assessment and scenarios, communication, and planning and preparedness all move ahead at the same time. We make a big distinction between communication and embedding and planning and preparedness. Last click. And I like to show this little red slide on the right here simply because, as I like to tell people, human, the human mind is wonderful. If you give us a complex problem, someday we're going to solve it. It's the obvious that takes us longer to understand. But even the littlest among us know that a little collaboration could get some water to the most vulnerable. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Roger. Um, we are running behind schedule, so I won't. Uh, uh, your presentation was really excellent. And uh, one of the questions that was asked was, are these slides going to be available in terms of uh, being on, on a website? And uh, um, let's say that Paul, the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction has avail made avail will make available to all of the speakers who wish to have them to have their presentations put on the ICLR website. Uh, and uh, I meant to ask you this formally in a letter earlier, so I'll, we'll send it around, but we'll work with you to make sure that this is up. And I could just say to thank Roger, who also not only great, gave this great talk, but initiated the idea of preparing a report that would summarize the, the discussion, the, the, the presentations, the discussions across the ones, and we're, we're, we'll work on that one too. So, um, so thank you very much, Roger. I'm afraid we'll have to uh, move on to Anna, who's the next presentator. Um, and here it is uh, on the Canadian National Climate Archive. And just in case you're not aware about archives and things, uh, we do have a person on the on the on the one of our listeners is uh, Jim Baker, who's an old colleague of mine who used to be the head of NOAA back in the Bill Clinton era. And Jim has joined it at my invitation. Uh, and uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, he knows all about these kind of things. So over to you, Anna. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Anna Deptustav, and it is my privilege to present the results of the work of all of the authors of this paper. That's me, except me, Chris Cossack, Brian Vanamaker from CSCAN International Incorporated, and Howley Content Interface Corporation. Next, please. Let me start with acknowledging all who contributed to the success. That is my MSc Management, Innovation and Youth Engagement Division Future Fund Group, University of Western Ontario Libraries and Archives, Public Services and Procurement Canada, Matan Quebec team, Corporate Services Financial Branch, as well as Administrative and Procurement Local Team, uh, University Students and Casual. In addition, let me thank CIMO's pre organizer, especially Professor Gordon McBean, for making this event possible. Next. Today, I will touch on Canadian Climate Archives, both hard copy and digital, long-term preservation, digitization, and uh, prospect for online access to our resources. Next. For over 180 years, thousands of weather observers and volunteers have recorded weather data and information at thousands of climate stations across Canada. This vast collection of climate data is stored within the National Climate Archives, and that is our Canadian national treasure. Our work is to ensure that these efforts are preserved and accessible for all to use. Next, please. Taking weather observations was a huge effort over many years. Next, please. Climate Hard Copy Archives preserves these records, these efforts in the data logs, in the meteorological forms and microfilms. I wanted to point out that paper and microfilms when stored properly can endure over 500 years. 
Next, please. The Digital Climate Archives holds over 3 million of different original meteorological forms. However, presently, they, are, they can be accessed only through internal network and only for one page at the time. Next, please. The collection of the 2304 forms going back to 1840s represents the, the most complete and longest national series of recorded observations. This is very special and very important collection for us. 2304 is monthly form with a day, daily temperature and precipitation data taken once or twice per day. Next, please. Over the 180 years, daily forms went through many format changes, and as you can expect. This picture illustrated the daily forms evolution over the years. Most recently, as part of our scanning project, we actually started capturing the form number and form name. This will allow us in the future to trace the evolution of meteorological forms in Canada. Next, please. While forms were changing over the time, the handwriting was changing even faster. Over the years, temperature and precipitation values were keyed and entered to the National Climate Archives. The manual key punching of all 2304 data proved to be very costly in terms of time and resources. Digitizing using the optical character recognition would be impossible to achieve with an acceptable degree of precision for these types of documents. The automated OCR process would face a number of challenges, including the variety of the handwriting, meteorological symbols, writing outside the expected area, and so on. Manual review and revision of all forms would always need to be applied. Knowing that, we believe that creating a quality scan that provides a true copy of the original form and offering easy users access to those scans seems to be the most preferable approach. Next, please. Two developments happened during the last few years which were breakthrough in our effort to provide access to the 2304 collection. Firstly, Treasury Board funding to digitize the historical portion, historical means from 1840 to 1960, of the 2304 collection. This historical portion of the collection is presently stored in a modern, state-of-the-art archive facility located at the University of Western Ontario. The university is archiving about 900 boxes of 2304 forms representing close to 3,000 climate stations. The second breakthrough was due to the due to the Environment and Climate Change Canada Innovative Future Fund Award that allowed us to adopt commercial off-the-shelf multimedia access software to develop the innovative visual interactive quality assurance tools called Vika tools. Vika tools ensure that only good quality scans will enter into the climate archive. This project will add about an additional 1 million meteorological form scans to the National Climate Archives, assuring reliable historical record preservation. The next slide will show video on how the VCA tools works. Next uh, slide and video, please. This short video illustrates the interactive portion of the quality assurance process. What we're showing here is a selection of 
uh, the second group of 500 forms from the Yukon. You can access all of the forms with the slider control at the bottom. Very quickly, notice the different aspect ratios of the forms, even in this one set of 500. You can access the forms also, step through them automatically with a play pause button to speed things up uh, a bit, and also once paused, then can step forward one at a time. We look, scan through here, we see an obvious uh, blank button or a blank form. Uh, press on the B button sends that to the to the blanks and shows the form name that's been recorded and steps forward by one. Similarly, there are forms that need to be sent to a senior archivist for review or for some other action. And here's one, for example, where it appears as though the entire platter of the scanner was saved, just the form itself, but all the information is still there. So that one will be sent for review and clipping before being sent to the archive. So at any point, the analyst can review the process or the progress by looking first at the at the blanks. Quickest way to do this is with the uh, automatic playthrough and speed it up. And this takes care of the case where there's been some finger trouble and this one was put in by mistake. So this is saved back to the uh, original forms. For the review, uh, the archivist will go through more slowly. There are four that need to be clipped and can zoom in to look at details to see whether this form should be recorded in the, in the archive. So in short, the quality assurance process starts with the batch of 500 raw scans to work with at one session. 500 is arbitrary number. Images go through the enhancement run to improve their contrast and readability. Then all scans are QA using Vika tools. After that, we end up with a smaller set of good quality scans ready to be uploaded to the National Climate Archives. Next, please. While continuing the digitalization and QA process, we hope to start working on providing access. Building on the experience with Vika tools and the off-the-shelf access software, we expect that further experimentation and expansion of this innovative approach will work towards better access to all climate digital collections. This could make environment and climate change 180 years legacy of weather and climate data observation accessible to the large audience. There may be actually many ways to access climate data, by station, by year, alphabetically, by region, and so on. Now we will demonstrate interface using Canadian map. Next slide, please. This video illustrates how we might use the same tools to build an interface that allows a user to access and explore information that has already been stored in an archive, in this case, principal station data. Using a touch screen and a map of Canada showing the locations, we go to one of the station locations, click on it, and immediately have access to a 48-page report from that station. Each page and each chart on each page is immediately accessible for use. We can step out to the map again, pick another location, say Comox, and again have immediate access to that 48 page station report. Or fly out and across the country to Goose Bay and similarly access the report from there. Or we can use the slider control to access any of the 136 reports that have been archived.
So leveraging the current digitalization experience, we would, would allow us to extend that quick access capability across Environment Canada network and later to extend that effort to internet online access in line with the Open Data Initiative. This could make this climate data readily available nationally and internationally to research scientists, engineers, academics, and to the public. Exactly the same process could be implemented for other digitized data collections, such as weather maps, other records, documents, or videos. Next, please. In summary, we are actively operating ever-growing archives, both hard copy and digital. We are establishing quality process to ensure that only good scams enter into the climate archives. And we are ready to start working on effective and efficient online access to these important forms. If you are interested in access to these data sets or have records that would benefit from very similar approach, please do not hesitate to contact either Chris Kosak or myself. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Anna. Uh, this You're was welcome. very interesting and very historic. Uh, and looking ahead, I, uh, I think, uh, again, we're running behind schedule overall, so uh, I don't have any questions lined up here on the chat box, except to say that I think it's a clear, um, no, there, well, actually, there was a question um, about the availability to researchers. If you could give a very short answer to that one, and then we'll move on to Rene. So what was the question? The, the question was asked by Victoria on, are any of these metadata station reports currently available to researchers? Um, well, temperature and precipitation data are available on the climate data online, but the forms, uh, they can be made available for someone who asks, who knows where they are. I can always send you the, the digital scans, but not quite yet. Um, we hope to make them more accessible and available in the future. Good. Thank you very much. So now, in view of time, we will move ahead to Rennie uh, Cyber, who is the Professor of Geography and other things at McGill University. We'll talk about communicating Windsor storms via natural language processes of social media. Another interesting topic, uh, as uh, my colleague Jim Baker just sent me a note saying, thanks for saying his name, but he said, this is really fascinating to have so many different things all together, and I think this is good. Hopefully it's a benefit to us all, it certainly is to me. So thank you, over to you, Rennie. Uh, thank you, Gordon, and I will be my own timekeeper, unless someone wants to yell at me in call time. Uh, about is fair play. Uh, so um, I'm reporting on a project we have with Environment and Climate Change Canada on communicating uh, climate change um, with um, artificial intelligence. So um, our question is, how do we make sense in real time of social media coming from the public about extreme weather events like snowstorms. Uh, during snowstorm, social media can be valuable, for example, for gauging where affected people are obtaining their information, reacting to it. And in fact, we have a separate social network analysis uh, subproject to try to gauge where people are actually getting weather information from. Uh, affecting uh, effectively disseminating useful information to affected people and providing situ situational awareness to crisis managers okay uh, social media has tons of advantages um, it is a high volume and comes in very quickly um, and you can get a lot of inference about how people are reacting to extreme weather events but you know, I was, if you're a crisis manager, you can probably comprehend 100 tweets and maybe even 1,000, but what about 100,000 tweets? Uh, social media can be redundant and filled with noise. 
it may have very little grammatical structure as well. So we look to artificial intelligence and because we're looking at text, specifically natural language processing, uh, to analyze these large volumes and or the rapidity of data, to filter out irrelevant information, and to help us extract value from social media so that we're all more resilient in the face of extreme weather events. Sorry, I haven't been telling you to advance the next slide. Sorry about that, Hal. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so this is the slide that says, we developed several NLP models for Twitter snowstorm data. <clears throat> uh, we started with a supervised classification. So I'm going to describe the two predominant methods of NLP in artificial intelligence, supervised and unsupervised classification. Uh, we began with supervised classification, which has become a standard in the crisis management literature. Uh, we tested its performance on tweets related to the Newfoundland snowstorm over the week of January 18th. Um, we identified a few issues that are key to being able to effectively analyze user reactions namely the gold standard for training the model crisis nlp proved to be somewhat inadequate for snow um, a, a lot of the tweets ended up in two large categories called other useful information and irrelevant information and that doesn't gauge the public reaction very well uh, so to have this work in the weather community, labels ne need to be relatively fluid. So I'm talking about supervised classification. What does that mean? This is a process that organizes content into predetermined categories. And what's nice about it is it can categorize in near real time. But the caveat is it requires an enormous training data set. And what do I mean by that? I mean a large corpus of data that has been um, classified manually and it's usually done through a crowdsourcing platform like Amazon Mechanical Turk. Our model was trained, as I mentioned, with the gold standard called Crisis NLP uh, with some 16,000 tweets, primarily from floods, hurricanes and earthquakes. So you can see where there might be some problems emerging. But to give you a sense of the categories of supervised classification, here they are. Um, so you can see that there is a kind of a universality of uh, these categories, very useful for crisis managers, perhaps less useful for um, people who are doing climate modeling or weather modeling. Uh, here's one, infrastructure and utilities damage, uh, which tries to gain from the tweets that are being contributed by individuals, uh, reports of damaged buildings, roads and bridges, or the disruption of utilities. Sorry, how? I'm still forgetting to tell you to move to the next slide. The next slide, please. Um, here's our uh, classification of the snowstorm. Uh, it's important to mention that you actually need to filter the tweets and to geofence the tweets ahead of time. Uh, at the bottom, you'll see the various filtering uh, hashtags. You don't always need to use has hashtags to do the filtering that we used uh, to harvest our tweets. Um, and um, what is of note is, and this is a logarithmic scale, is the vast number of <laughs> tweets that are ending up in other useful information and non-related or irrelevant. So next slide. Uh, so you can see examples of the classified tweets. Um, it's nice to look at the very uh, bottom for irrelevant information and you can see probably crisis managers don't need uh, someone being able to nail the landing on the stool jump uh, to effectively address um, this winter storm uh, issue. Just checking, Next. Renee, I'm not sure we're on the same slide that you're think looking at. So we're okay. on. So sorry about that, How uh, I'm zipping through. So you should see a slide number, you should be on slide number seven. And 
And sorry, Vicky, and sorry, Bohan. <clears throat> oh, we're going the wrong way. <laughs> Are you there? Yeah. Just slide seven. Rene? Can you see slide seven of the boxes of injured, dead, donations, irrelevant yep. information? Oh. That must be seven, right? Yes, yeah, slide seven. Do you have it? No, we're on slide 16. No, wait a minute. I'm not sure which one we're on. There's one that that boxes with dead people okay, on it. Keep going now. Advance to the next slide. So how I'm my worst uh, timekeeper and slide manager. Um, so um, here are some slides that ended up in the um, other useful, and you can see perhaps that we may very well want to collect these kinds of. Um, tweets and categorize them differently. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, then we moved on to unsupervised classification because we found we were missing a lot of uh, tweets. Um, unsupervised classification, in this case we use topic modeling, categorizes a corpus when the labels are not known. Um, and uh, so when they don't fit into uh, what people have already annotated as, um, as useful um, content. Uh, what happens in unsupervised classification is the top relevant terms uh, are assigned to a cluster and they can be interpreted and hopefully we can find these emergent topics and we can label, label these emergent topics. And the preparation, uh, is less labor intensive because you do not need that enormous uh, training data set and you do not need to pre-train your model in that way. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, it, we should note that we actually pre-trained both our supervised and unsupervised classifications. We have a number of uns, uh, supervised classification models. We have a number of unsupervised classification models. Uh, we pre-train them with contextual models um, because, uh, and I give you an example here of flood. Uh, the word flood can appear in both flood of cash and a flood waters. Obviously we want the latter and not the former. And uh, unless you do this initial step, you're not going to get the topology, the word topology. Um, so um, that's one of the things we did. Um, there's also a challenge in doing um, either supervised or unsupervised classification on tweets because of what's called data sparsity or a lack of word co-occurrence patterns. Um, so um, you actually switch to a um, contextual model uh, called biterm. Um, um, and uh, I'm going to re be reporting both on the results of one of our latent Dirichlet uh, allocation models and also one of our uh, sentence BERT plus K means models. Uh, so, next slide. This is what comes out of an unsupervised classification. So, we have not labeled the topics here, they're called topic zero to topic eight. But uh, part of the process of using unsupervised classification is indeed uh, doing that human intervention and doing the labeling. Um, I put a box around topic number four because that does give you some sense of how unsupervised classification can tease out topics that are similar to the supervised classification. But one thing I want to point out here is both that there are logistical things or physical things, and there are also some kind of psychological things that you might want to be looking at when people are com communicating this information. And also, it can be extraordinarily difficult to tease meaning out of either supervised or unsupervised classification, and that's a huge challenge. Next slide. Um, here is an example of 
visualizing um, snowstorm, uh, snowstorm tweet topics. This is called LDA Viz. It's visualization software. And it's quite useful to understand the predominance of keywords in any one topic and also the disaggregation of topics. Uh, so you can see that topic one is quite distinct from a cluster of topics in the upper left hand quadrant. So uh, sorry about the mix up there with the slides, concluding uh, the penultimate slide. <clears throat> um, there's two takeaways here. One is that, first of all, we looked at the way people react to weather. A takeaway is that we see these practical and emotional reactions, which can point to uh, the need to attend to psychological as well as physical resilience. And by harvesting these tweets, uh, hopefully crisis managers can better respond to extreme weather events. The reason that I have, um, these um, this table here is also to alert you to to alert you to the fact that um, there is a lot of human intervention and human judgment calls that are required to use these typical kinds of artificial intelligence. It is not something that you can just pull off the shelf and use immediately without making decisions about the number of topics or the choice or the application of a training data set. So just uh, some caveats as you go forward and say, oh, I know Python, I know R, ah, here's some tool I can use. You have to make a lot of decisions along the way. And our last slide, uh, thank you. And uh, you can uh, follow me on Twitter or email me at renee.sieber at mcgill.ca if you'd like further information. One more slide there, Al. We mm -hmm. want to get the one with their slide on. One more. Yeah. There it is. There it is. So, Thank you, Gordon. Gordon. We're glad that uh, you use uh, Twitter since you can catch up with that guy with the five letter acronym south of the border on tweeting. I don't even know how to tweet, so I'll learn from all of you. Anyway, um, we're really running behind schedule, so I think if we can take advantage of the offer to have the tweets, and we're going to, as I said, put these for, assuming all the presenters agree, we'll put the, these PowerPoints up on the website of ICLR uh, and find a place of sort of can be highlighted and found. So I'd like to, at this point, we need to move on to the final speaker of the session, which is Paul Godin, who is the, um, Paul is a postdoctoral fellow at uh, York University in Toronto. Uh, and he's gonna talk about collision-induced absorption of all these chemicals and their, ancient, their effects on ancient Martian atmospheres. So over to you, Paul. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, so, as Gordon said, I'm going to be talking about uh, ancient Mars. So, as a planetary scientist, and I'm going to just go to the next slide, please. All right. So, this is really planetary sciences are a large interdisciplinary effort. So, particularly, we're tackling this problem of ancient Mars, and the problem I'm referring to is this sort of paradox between what we see on the surface and what we see in the atmosphere. So, if you look at the surface of Mars. The images on the side there are comparing surface features on Mars to surface features on Earth. And there's a lot of stuff that looks similar to flowing water structures on Earth. Valley networks, uh, lakes, shorelines, effects of glaciation. So that would imply that, you know, at one point in time, Mars had flowing water. If you look at the composition of the surface from a chemistry's perspective, a lot of the, the substances you see there can only sort of form in certain temperature ranges. So phyllosilicates and lack of carbonates, those would imply that Mars is also warm at one point in time. But now this sort of warm and wet early Mars is at odds with what we know about the Martian atmosphere. So several million years ago, the sun was actually a little weaker than it is today. So you would have less energy coming to warm the surface of the planet. Um, you can look at the atmosphere pressure on Mars today and try and model it backwards to what it was back in the past and you would have a very low atmospheric pressure which again would result in a cold uh, Mars, ancient Mars. 
And then again, sort of coming back to this sort of chemistry idea, depending on what chemical compounds you see at the surface would imply what chemical compounds could have been in the atmosphere. And there's not really strong greenhouse gases. So this is the big paradox in the planetary science community of how can Mars have been warm and wet from a geological perspective, and yet also looks like it would be cold from an atmospheric perspective. And this is really what this talk is about in trying to work towards understanding this. Uh, next slide, please. So one potential way to get around this issue is collision-induced absorption. What this is, is when you have two molecules in a gas, each molecule can absorb uh, atmospheric radiation in its own way. And those are the single line absorptions. But if two molecules collide together, there's a temporary moment in time where the two molecules form a supramolecular complex. And that two molecule complex has its own absorption features. So if you're to look at Beer Lambert's law for a gas mixture, which is this equation I have there, you have, let's say in this gas mixture, you have carbon dioxide plus one other species, species in this case, either methane or hydrogen gas. Your total absorption is going to be absorption due to individual CO2 molecules, your absorption due to individual hydrogen molecules, but also these combined absorption features of a CO2 molecule interacting with a CO2 molecule, hydrogen interacting with hydrogen, and then the mixed term of CO2 and hydrogen or CO2 and methane. And it was these CIA collision-induced absorption features, CIA, that was lacking from a lot of Martian models. And so this paper came out that suggested that maybe this was the missing key. And that's sort of what's shown in this figure in the corner. This is from uh, Wordsworth et al, 2015. And what they were showing is if you model, if you were to include CIA from CO2 with hydrogen and CO2 with methane, you have some weak but significant absorption in a little atmospheric window on the Mars spectrum. Now, one thing I should mention that those lines there were actually theoretical lines. The big problem here, one reason that no one ever included this in the first place was these lines, this measurement didn't exist. No one had measured CO2 plus methane or CO2 plus hydrogen. People had done nitrogen and hydrogen, nitrogen and methane, and so people tried to use those as a proxy, and those are those dotted lines in that figure, but they're quite a bit weaker than what the Wordsworth group simulated to these uh, CIAs to be. The one thing I want to draw on that figure there is it is a log scale on the y-axis. So it is a small, CIAs are typically a very small effect, but because they're significant in this atmospheric window on Mars, they could prove to be quite powerful. In order to measure those CIA effects, you really, because it's a weak feature, you want a long path length. So if you're going to try and measure this in the lab, you look at Beer-Lambert's law again, the first term there is this L, which is the optical path length through your sample. So we figured we would take a crack at trying to measure these, uh, these CIAs experimentally and confirm Wordsworth's uh, theoretical calculation. Next slide, please. So to do this, we traveled to the Canadian light source synchrotron that is located in Saskatoon. The reason we went there is they have experimental facilities that we did not have at York University, but would be useful for this experiment. Uh, next slide. So in particular is the FireR beam line, and they have what's called a white cell. So that's that bottom schematic there. A white cell is a spectroscopy gas cell, but you put mirrors at both ends of the chamber. So when your light beam comes in, you can bounce it back and forth repeatedly between the cells. So even though your base cell length is only two meters long, depending on the number of bounces you get, you can get longer distances. In particular, this one at the CLS is able to go up to about 70 meters. And a technique we're gonna use here to measure these absorption cross sections is uh, Fourier transform spectroscopy. So we, so we had to do the, the light source, I will say it's a, it's a very busy place. It's hard to get beam time there. So we were awarded about a month's worth of beam time where we would be able to run 24 hour shifts. The facility's open 24 hours. So my team and I, we were there, we were doing shifts and we were trying to get all these temperature dependent cross section measurements to compare to the theory. So let's go to next slide. So this is the CO2 CH4 CIA that we were able to measure. So we were taking it at three different temperatures. The black line with the gray shading is our experimental results. The dotted red line is 
the Wordsworth simulation that we were trying to validate. The green line is that nitrogen value. As I said, nitrogen was the original proxy used in this story. And so we are including that to show how much stronger this effect actually is compared to nitrogen. Uh, there's a blue line, which is while we were trying to do these measurements, there was a group in France who was doing the same thing, who had the same idea we did. Uh, they only did a room temperature measurement, not temperature dependence. And their result is shown there. Uh, they also were able to do theoretical calculations at different temperatures, which is their blue solid line in the other temperature plots. Um, part of the reason why the, their, the Francis group error bars are much better than ours is the short answer is their white cell has a longer path length, which will help with single to noise. They also were allowed to do higher gas mixing ratios than we were. Um, methane and hydrogen are explosive. So the CLS was not happy about us trying to put a lot of that gas in a tight enclosed space. They didn't like the idea of us making bombs in their basement. So we were limited on how much of those gases we could put in the cell, which also drives our signal down, which incre unfortunately increases our error. However, we can still, despite uh, the noisiness of our signal, we see agreement with uh, the Francis group's uh, room temperature measurement. And we see that our measurement agrees quite well with what they predict for other temperatures. But the start of this was to compare to Woodsworth's value. And we see that Woodsworth basically overestimated by almost a factor of two. Uh, moving uh, next slide, please. So now this is for hydrogen. Uh, same story. This is a little messier, mainly because hydrogen is more explosive than methane. And we were further limited on how much we can put in methane in the chamber. So we had to do even less mixing ratios. Uh, we also noticed that there was more water contamination in our hydrogen experiment. So water absorbs quite strongly in these wavelength ranges, and that was a big source of uncertainty in my data. So while this isn't the nicest data set, again, we kind of see that this is about half as strong as Woodsworth predicted and agrees quite well with uh, what the France people in France have come up as well. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So now that we have an updated CIA spectrum, the logical thing to do would be to go back and reevaluate these climate, Martian climate models to see if, is this the saving grace for water on Mars? Could this solve this whole paradox? So we partnered with a fellow out of Japan named Ramsey Ramirez, who had done some of these early Mars climate models. And we said, hey, do you want to work on this with us? We have these new updated cross sections. And he said, yes. So he just basically plugged into his existing code our updated CIA values. So his code is a single column cloud-free radiative climate model. Um, and what he did, he simulates a few things for us. This first one here is surface temperature as a function of pressure. So your total atmospheric pressure. And then he's looking at different mixing ratios of gases within there. So the key thing to see is if you look at the graph, so dotted lines are with the updated, oh no, so dotted lines are Woodsworth's original prediction and solid lines are using our new CIA values, which are half as strong. So first of all, you see obviously that with the weaker CIA values, you need to have more gas or higher pressures in order to get increased warming. Um, we're limited on these graphs by going about two bar. That's because a lot of Mars models suggest that at most the ancient Mars atmosphere was no more than two bar. So this is supposed to be a problem for methane, the lower panel there, where at, at limited at two bar and even up to 10% methane, you never really crack this freezing point of water. You can't, you also don't want to go more than 10% of methane because if you go above that, you start forming a chemical haze that will actually provide a cooling effect on Mars. However, for hydrogen, the upper panel, you can see that with a two bar atmosphere and even as low as 5% hydrogen, you can get liquid water on Mars. Uh, next slide, please. So another thing we modeled is the planetary albedo. So with increasing concentrations of methane or hydrogen, you're going to have increased scattering, which will lower the albedo, which is seen by the colored lines okay. gain weaker. Um, comparing the Woodsworth uh, absorption cross-section values to our updated ones. For hydrogen, there is an effect on 
the planetary albedo, there really isn't one with methane. The reason for this being, because we saw on the previous slide, methane doesn't really achieve significant warming, but because hydrogen does make things warmer, that will in turn increase the amount of water vapor, which will have an impact on the planetary albedo. Next slide. So as a last thing, uh, we looked at the temperature profiles as a function of altitude. Again, comparing if we use the old CAA values with our newer ones. And what we see here is in the upper atmosphere, it doesn't quite doesn't change much which CIA values you use, but as you get down to the surface, things start to diverge and it becomes a significant effect using the correct CIA strength. Uh, and then last slide. So in conclusion, these were the first temperature dependent experimental measurements of these uh, CIA values. They agreed quite well with previous uh, experimental uh, previous experimental groups publication. They ultimately disproved Wordsworth's original model, which was twice as strong as it should have been, but that's okay when we're running these radio transfer calculations now with the updated one, is we find that hydrogen works still as a potential greenhouse gas. Methane, however, is not quite as promising. Although this isn't necessarily the end of the story because hydrogen, unfortunately, is a very light molecule and happens to escape atmospheres quite readily. So it may not stick around long enough. Now to address that issue, people have looked at this idea of transient warming where you would have maybe a volcanic eruption or comets come and dump a lot of hydrogen or methane on the surface and it sticks around for a couple hundred thousand years and you get periods of warming, then you go cold again and then you have another volcanic eruption or another comet and then you can get warmed again. So this is the current theory about why Mars would be uh, potentially could have been warm and wet, but also still cold as it is today. Thank you. Any questions? Um, interesting presentation. Uh, quite very different as we've gone from uh, social media to uh, the Martian atmosphere. Um, how? Well. You mentioned at one point the idea that the, the sun was so much lighter, yet I wasn't, or at least less energetic giving off things. I wasn't sure how that related to the fact that the Mars seemed to be warmer. <laughs> no, so that's what makes, that just adds to the challenge of a warm or ancient Mars. So several million years ago, the sun is not outputting as much energy so mm -hmm. all planets would be colder than today. So you, it's just, it makes the challenge even more difficult okay. to get a warm enough surface. And a question came from somebody else, uh, Fred Conway saying, how is this relevant to this, the process of terrestrial conditions now in that sense? How do you like, relate that? I'm assuming that's what the question is. Um, this is relevant in terms of I would say CIA calculations and modeling. So I mean, collision induced absorptions will exist in any gas mixture. And if you want the most accurate radio transfer models possible, you probably should consider including those in. And part of what this, it's not just that we did an experimental confirmation of one set. We also show how uh, that calculation that was originally done was off by a factor of two. So for people who want to potentially go and model other CIA spectra, it's something to take note that you might want to be careful in how you do those calculations. So, because these CIA, this deriving experimental CIA is quite difficult, but if you can do reliable modeling calculations of them, that would be beneficial. Good. Well, thank you very much, uh, Paul, and thanks to all of the speakers who've been here. We've had uh, attendance over this uh, event from, well, we were over 100 at times. We've gone up and down, but uh, that's very good turnout and uh, positive comments. I'm pleased that we've had this uh, presentation. I'd like to thank Hao Li for uh, uh, organizing, well, let's say running all of the uh, IT stuff has been an amazing job with all these various PowerPoints and PDFs and videos embedded and things. He put them together and we'll work with him to make sure we get up and available in some way the uh, these presentations as the authors agree uh, for the uh, 
anyone who can access it and we'll put, make that information available through the uh, uh, CMOS uh, source. I would just like to remind you for those that uh, there are actually no sessions of the CMOS online program tomorrow, the, the Friday the 5th. I've got three other meetings, but that's irrelevant. But on Monday, we will have a full day, Monday the 8th. We've got sessions on Arctic sea ice, on resiliency in health and environment in the changing climate, on flood risks under climate change, and a whole issue at the end of the day, Monday afternoon, on the changing Arctic science and policy studies. So those will be a pretty interesting set on Tuesday, the 15th, sorry, on the June 9th, session 15, will be on Earth Systems Models as Tools for Societal Resilience, and on all day June 10th on the climate change information supporting resilient infrastructure. In other words, how do you make your society actually adapt to things, build the resilience that we've been talking about uh, in a very, let's say, highly technical scientific way. And I also like to thank Rene for her, uh, her leadership on timing of things to, uh, uh, to thank also Quinn who got this organ this thing all organized um, and thank you all as participants and speakers for this session it's been very interesting and as we say uh, well if you look at the bottom of the slide in the corner there it's a picture of the London community march on climate change some a year or so ago and I took a picture of this man wife and their two kids and their signs say unite behind the science save the earth I asked her if I could take a picture and she was very pleased and I said, uh, can I use it? She said, yes. So from everyone, uh, thank you. Thank you from Don Martin Hill for her comments. Uh, and I also thank, uh, in case you're not aware, Ivan Semenyuk of the Globe and Mail newspaper has been listed as a, been online all day. So uh, we've had a lot of various kinds of participants in this session and I thank you all very much for doing this. And uh, I see one last chat. I think I've no, I've got them all. Um, on the, on then from Mark Don, uh, and we're going to. I think there's been some really interesting intersections, potentials, and I think reality of making things happen of working together on a variety of these issues as we move ahead. Um, so with that, I thank you all. Um, it's now th almost 3.45, sorry, 2.45. So we're only 15 minutes beyond time. That's pretty good. So you can now, we're, we're down to 48 people as you guys left before they, some of them left before I had a chance to say all my final comments, but that's important, that's not important. So thank you very much. And uh, let's conclude this session. And au revoir la prochaine fois. Uh, I will learn to say it in some, uh, um, anyway, thank you very much. So end of meeting and I'll send a note to all the speakers about, and to Al about organizing our website in terms of putting together this information. Thank you.